um, in, in, um, in, in uh, recognition of this somber anniversary of the attack on the United States um, <coughs> on September 11th, 2001. So if you would join me in a moment of silence, please. item on <coughs> the agenda is uh, citizens' comments. Is there anyone here for citizens' comments? Okay, I don't see anybody, so I will not read the guidelines for public comment or review the um, policy for public comments. So the next item on the agenda is the, the chair's update. So I just have a few things. Um, that I just wanted to let the committee know that in July, beginning of July, I attended MASC's Summer Institute and they had a, um, a session on the role of the chair, which I found extremely helpful and useful. Got a lot of good information. Um, but the other thing that was helpful was that I was in a room with other school committee chairs from all over the state and um, got some, uh, some good ideas and, and learned some things. And one of the things I learned, much to my surprise, is that there are people that are bossier than me. <laughs> and so I might have to up my game a little bit, but subtly, hopefully. Um, but I'll, I'll speak to another thing that came up uh, later on on the agenda, but I found it, it very worthwhile and was happy to see it so well attended. I think it was like July 12th or 13th. It's in Marlboro, it's very good. Um, a reminder about attendance, um, there are seven of us, our quorum is, there should be eight, our quorum is five. So please be sure to let me know if you are not going to be able to make a meeting as soon as you know, and if looking ahead, um, <coughs> you notice that you have some, a conflict on your calendar, let me know, because if we don't have a quorum, we can't meet, and if we miss a meeting, given the heft of our planning calendar, it means we probably have to reschedule the meeting. So that's just a reminder on that. Um, uh, I wanted to make folks aware that on August 19th, <coughs> the Department of Education uh, released an updated superintendent's rubric. Um, those of you who have participated um, or just have an awareness of the rubrics for um, the evaluation of educators in the state of Massachusetts, <coughs> rubrics for the superintendent, um, for uh, educators, for administrators. There is a new one. Um, the, the former one, and, and those of us who have completed the evaluation before, is very dense, if you will. Uh, several of us expressed concern over some of the things that we were asked to evaluate that have no, we have no, no visibility to like evaluation of administrators. That's not within our purview. So this is a new rubric. Um, and what I would like to do is we don't have to adopt it. Um, Brooke has indicated an interest in using it this year. I think it makes a lot of sense. I would like to send it out to folks to look at. I'll send both um, so you can see the difference. And I know that uh, Brooke is currently working with the personnel subcommittee on her goals. And so there's the superintendent's annual plan. But part of the evaluation process is the identification of indicators um, from the rubric to also be part of the evaluation. So I just wanted to share that and we'll send that out to folks. Okay. Um, and just a reminder, I may have said this, and it, it's probably in the um, school committee handbook, that many times we get correspondence as a whole committee. And when you see that, um, please trust that I will respond um, in some way, shape, or form. Sometimes the, 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 the contents of that communication is not within our purview, and I, <coughs> I let the correspondent uh, know that. But if something in the correspondence uh, concerns you, if you have questions, uh, please get in touch with me, and um, I will answer any questions that you have. Um, and again, um, 
commenting on or responding to issues related to personnel and students is not within the purview of the school committee. Okay, so we have our student representative, Izzy, how are you? I'm good, how are you? So glad to see you here. Thank you. And you have an update for us? Yes, I do. Okay, let's hear it. Um, so this is our first full week of school, which we are halfway through, um, and everyone's kind of starting to get over that initial uh, stress of the <laughs> week. <laughs> yeah. um, and even the freshmen are finally like getting their schedules down and stuff. Um, so for the sports, um, we've had an exciting start. Uh, spirit days are in full swing, so the hallways are always filled with uh, girls with face paint and tutus and glitter and all that sort of stuff. Um, girls volleyball is undefeated 3-0, and um, and it's really been just a show every game. Uh, we keep almost giving our coach a heart attack. Um, the golf team is currently 4-0. Um, girls soccer is 1-1, one and, one, and football has their first game this Saturday at noon on <coughs> the turf at Neshoba. Um The music department is hoping to host their first, uh, or not their first, their annual car wash uh, this Saturday at nine o'clock uh, in front of the high school. It's five dollars per car. Uh, there will also be baked goods and all the proceeds go towards the music department. Um, the center school welcomed 74 kindergartners and another 24 new students, uh, grades one through five. All students participated in their first all school meeting on the first day of school. And last night they welcomed uh, the parents at back to school night. Uh, and in other news, Neshoba has uh, a new ASL club um, that meets every week on Mondays and Wednesdays. And um, on Thursday is Neshoba's open house where the parents get to walk their kids' schedules and meet all the teachers. Um, Izzy, what is ASL? Um, American Sign Language. Oh, wow. And this is a new club? Yeah, it's run by the choir director and a few of the students. Excellent. Um, any questions for Izzy? Were you finished your report or did you yeah, have more? That's it. Okay. <laughs> Just one check. Yeah. Thank you. And thank you. We appreciate the updates about other things going on <coughs> at the other schools <coughs> and look forward to your future reports. Thank you so much. Thank you. Okay. Okay, Superintendent. Oh, I'm sorry. So, did you have no, but, but I want to, because uh, I'm not sure if she's going to leave right away <laughs> before, before you walk out the door. Uh, so, um, I just wanted to ask you, did anything special happen this summer to you? <laughs> yeah. Uh, so I was part of the Spartans Drum and Bugle Corps. Uh, if you don't know what Drum and Bugle Corps is, it's basically a, it's a giant marching band, all brass players and percussion. Um, and we won the world championship. Which was cool. Isabel Sonia of Lancaster in the Showa Class of 2020 earned the title of World Champion at the Drum Corps International DCI Open Class World Championship Finals <coughs> in Marion, Indiana. As a member of the Spartans, a Nashua, New Hampshire based drum and bugle corps, Ibi performed throughout the country this summer and competed against almost 50 other student groups in pursuit of the title. In her first year with the Corps, Ibi played baritone and was named Brass Rookie of the Year for the elite six-time world champion Spartans. Ibby also performs in Na uh, Neshoba's concert band and pep band and sang the national anthem at newer school events. And we have some flowers we'd like to give you to write. Thank you. <laughs> Congratulations and thank you. Superintendent's report before I go into um, a, a presentation up here. Staff recognition. Um, three Neshoba Regional High School teachers were nominated for a, a 2019-20 Life Changer of the Year Award sponsored by National Life Group. This award recognizes and rewards K-12 uh, school employees who make a positive difference in the lives of students. The three Neshoba educators are Lauren Bullard, a life science teacher, Katie Jenkin, a social studies teacher, and Robert Griffith, a psychology teacher. Mrs. Bullard was recognized for her ability to foster community. Ms. Jenkins' classroom prowess was highlighted, as was Mr. Griffith's appreciation for his students. 
A total of 16 winners will be chosen across the country and cash prizes of $3,000 to $10,000 will be awarded. These cash prizes involve both personal awards and donations to schools. So we know that it's just nominations, but we're super proud of our teachers, so thank you. Absolutely. Um, so I'm going to go into a bit of a, an overview of our first uh, our, our first day back. This is much longer than I would normally um, do for superintendent's report, but I think in light of opening school and, and the number sheer number of topics that have come up, I'm going to actually do a little bit of teeing up here, and I know that Rob is going to pick up some pieces after, and uh, probably Lisa as well. So can we put up um, my presentation here? Do you video mind? Yeah, let's start with the video. If you haven't seen this, it's really worthwhile to take a look at it. And I just want to thank Todd, uh, who worked with uh, Michael and, and Cindy on pulling this together. We do this every year. Um, we're very conscientious of the songs that are chosen because it all leads to the theme that we're working on for the year. So we put a lot of thought into that very first day. So this plays as our staff is coming in. And so the music is pumping <coughs> everybody. Like there's a lot of energy in that room on that first day. And that's what I really want to focus on uh, to, uh, tonight. I'm going to speak a little bit about the first day. And at, uh, we were talking early about the importance of transparency and, and the work that we do. So I'm going to go through basically everything I did with the staff that day. That morning, we invite all staff in, so absolutely everyone. I, I'm not sure what your districts would do, but here we invite absolutely everyone. So our custodians are there, our <coughs> cafeteria workers are available, if they're available, if they're not pre uh, um, preparing food, they come in. Uh, all our secretaries are there, absolutely everyone is there. And that's how we start our first, our, our first day back. Um, 
if you take a look here is the agenda that we've got. Um, you can take a look certainly on your computers as well. The association, of course, always has its meeting first before we come in, and then we all move in at 8 o'clock. And I, I try to make sure that my remarks are around 10 to 10 or 10 to 15 that we're wrapped up and ready to go and moving into the buildings to do uh, the rest of the work that, that has to happen. In that time period, you'll see that we, um, we do awards. I want to do a shout out to Alita again. I think we had about 80 awards that we gave out this year. Uh, we give out uh, longevity awards for 5, 10, 15, 25, 30, 35 years. Uh, and um, that's really, really amazing to see all these people with a, that, that have put so much of their lives into the district. So that's very cool. Um, Todd gave an overview of the day. Kathy was there to give a, a welcome from the school committee. Um, and Marie recognizes uh, different people as well, um, especially our teachers who have uh, uh, just attain their professional status. Um, and then uh, then I wrap up with concluding uh, remarks. And so what I'm doing tonight is I'm not going to go into the, um, the vision component. I'm really going to focus <coughs> on more of the housekeeping tonight because that kind of ties in with what Rob and Lisa are going to talk about uh, shortly as well. So if we can go to the next page, please. <coughs> We, uh, Cindy and uh, actually it was Martina this year that gave the broad overview for the district professional development, which all ties into our DIP and the school improvement plans. Everything all ties together. So they give the broad overview of what our, our staff can expect moving forward. Um, they did review the DIP as well. Martina um, did a great job of uh, explaining that and going into detail. And then, of course, what they can, everyone can expect with the uh, professional development scheduled moving forward. <coughs> and then I'll start my last little bit. In terms of where our, uh, our various foci are for the year, safety continues uh, to, to be that piece. And I kind of broke it up this year. The first piece that you're looking at here is the different infrastructure and the strengthening of that infrastructure. And then and we're going to talk about non-facilities and we're going to talk about facilities. But the first is a non-facility uh, area. We're going to continue our work with our local safety partners. That's ongoing. I attended um, the chiefs and superintendents breakfast meeting um, yesterday for Middlesex County, uh, where the DA comes and speaks to us about safety. Yesterday, there was a, an emphasis on a prevention of uh, suicide um, and some general alerts about safety in general. So it's a really good opportunity to get together. We all get together in Lowell and review a, a, a number of items. So that work is ongoing. Trainings happened uh, again this, this year. Um, once the, the staff got back to their buildings, within that next day and a half, they all did a refresher on Alice. Lisa oversees all of that and gets it all orchestrated so everybody can go online and do a re basically a refresher. And then <clears throat> for those people who are new to the district, that's set up individually and separately and she takes care of that as well. So that everybody is basically on the same page uh, and, you know, within the first week or two weeks of school. We've already started our drills, um, the ongoing drills. Uh, a number of our schools have already had the, uh, the fire drill starting, uh, locked down, and those are all separate from the evacuation drills. And so we decided last year that we would really try to upfront as many of our drills during the good weather so we could run everybody in and out of the buildings. Uh, and so that's been ongoing. And the other thing I'd point out, and, and those of you who are educators already probably know this, our, our safety partners come into those <coughs> drills as well. So I mean, teachers and administrators don't do it on their own, all of our other safety. So there's generally ambulances here, fire trucks, and, and um, the, the police units are here as well during that time. Um, the Alice training I just mentioned, uh, that, that that has happened as well, and mosquitoes. Mosquitoes have been a hot topic for us in Triple E, and I know Rob's going to speak to that as well. Um, you'll note that I've sent out a number of um, uh, memos to our communities in the last little bit. Um, we've met personally with our Sto with a number of our Stowe Board of Health representatives <coughs> and a, a representative from the Neshoba Board of Health, which is kind of separate. Um, we did that with a large group uh, of us, uh, maybe about a week ago, um, and the the Bolton uh, Board of Health. We uh, we just connected through the town administrator back and forth, and he acted as a liaison. Lancaster, I'm actually meeting with them tomorrow, 
So um, our boards of health have been fabulous and working together and we've all shared the, the communication so that we're all basically all on the same page. The mosquitoes has been a, a one that's been a little bit um, kind of upping the ante a little bit because as we've been going on, for example, Stowe, I, I believe it was Stowe was just uh, designated as high, at a high level. So um, that's concerning for us. We took a look at it though and said if we're doing something for one community, of course, we want to do it for all three because we believe in the equity of treating all of our communities equally. Uh, Rob will probably speak to this. We've done spraying along the tree lines in all of our, around all of our buildings. We've done the first pass of that uh, probably about 13, 14 days ago. And uh, the next pass is ready to go. If it hasn't happened already, it will happen over the course of the next several days. That is totally separate from the memo that I sent out yesterday, which came from the Massachusetts um, Department of Agricultural Services <coughs> with the, the pest um, uh, division of that. They're looking at doing aerial spraying, and we got that, I want to say about 3 o'clock yesterday, and I think they were scheduled to spray at 4.30, I think is when the first spray was supposed to happen. And it was kind of, can you please let everybody know we're doing this? And it was like, oh my gosh, we've got like a very short period of time to be doing this. Um, they, they were looking at spraying, for obvious reasons, um, Stowe and, and Bolton. And so that would encompass our high school. And I got an email last, week, uh, last night about what about the high school. The high school is considered in Bolton, so that area would have been um, inclusive. Lancaster is not right now on that list, and so I'm sure that that will be a topic that's um, going to be discussed tomorrow, uh, according to their chairperson who I spoke with today. Um, other than that, uh, we've asked that uh, children, the smaller ones, we can't apply repellent, but if the parents think to maybe perhaps apply repellent before they send their children, of course, the obvious that we all understand is that repellent is going to last into the afternoon, right? <coughs> so we're aware of that. Um, I don't have a quick answer on that, but I know that we can't uh, physically um, administer that repellent. At that now, the high school games, uh, repellent is available for our high school students if they're doing football or whatever that they're doing out there. With that also came, um, in the last 24 hours, a whole reschedule for all of our athletic games. And so that is huge. That's an enormous undertaking. And that has a lot of implications that come with it. For example, when you compress and everybody's trying to play inside of a much shorter period of time, for example, there are only so many refs to go around. And so the refs are just backlogged right now, trying to get to as many games as they can, and, and we're trying to work this. So it has been a logistical nightmare for Tanya Rich as she's been working through this. Uh, we've been very cognizant to the time frames that have listed, been listed. I think that's on Mass DEP, right? And you'll see that the time frames literally, literally change every week because, of course, the sun goes down at a different time, you know, daily right now. So we've been following the Mass DEP guidelines throughout all of this. Uh, I think uh, the other thing we would mention is that uh, we've encouraged parents when long sleeves make sense. We understand that you can't send your children to school in 85 degree weather with long sleeves, but if they're playing outside, long sleeves where possible, both arms and legs make sense. Um, so I think we've done the best that we can do. I hope I'm not missing anything, Lisa and Rob. If I am, I'm sure that you'll bring it up after. But that gives you a general overview of where we're at uh, with, with the mosquito um, issue that we're con we've uh, been confronting this year. One of the questions that we asked the other day, of course, amongst ourselves is, will, be in, will we be in the same position again next year? Because everything we do right now, of course, is case setting precedent moving forward. And then Robin said something, said something, I think it's on the DESE, um, not the DESE, sorry, Mass EP website, that we're probably looking at this for the next two to three years, um, is what they're projecting. We, the memo that I sent out, not yesterday, but the day before, well, actually yesterday's memo has some too, but the day before, the memo before that had some, a couple of really good websites. If you haven't been onto those, I encourage <coughs> our parents to go onto those websites and take a look at them. Um, Stowe also has a very nice synoptic on its Board of Health um, website so if you go into just the the general town of Stowe and then the Board of Health is over to the right go, just kind of <coughs> click on it and it has a really nice synoptic of some things for parents to keep in mind so I encourage that you go on there as well so that's pretty much it to for mosquitoes um, the next item is um, and again remember we're talking this is all about safety uh, please access to cameras previously the police have had um, 
access to their communities. So for example, Lancaster had ability to go into the Lancaster schools, uh, Stowe, uh, Stowe had the ability to go to Stowe schools and Bolton, of course, the high school and um, the Florence Sawyer campus. One of the things that the police came and asked us um, is, and, and I understand, and we've got, honestly, I say this without any bias, I believe the best police forces that we could ever want to deal with in these three communities. Um, for example, they, they've got waivers, so for example, and this is not a good example to use, but if there was a bad guy, this is really simplistic language, a bad guy on the run from Lancaster and he hit Bolton, the Bolton police don't have to overtake that anymore. The Lancaster police, now, they, they've got waivers in place so that all police can move in all the time with anything, which is exactly what we would want. So for example, I mean, previously we've always, it's been kind of the underwritten rule that if anything happens at the high school, all three police forces would come in at the same time. What our police are saying to us, and, and I know that's just who they are, is they will all be there for all buildings, all the time regardless of their community that they belong to. So th they're saying, you know, they want to be able to look it up on their phones right away. If th something's going on in Stowe, they want to be able to see. And they, we've numbered all of the buildings, I'll talk about that in a minute too, so they can literally go in and see exactly where something's happening. Uh, so our, our technology um, unit has been working very closely with the district <coughs> offices. We have two dispatches, of course, one in Stowe and one uh, that the, the Devons that oversees Lancaster and Bolton. Um, so they've been working very closely this summer to make sure that they have the access that they need. So that's kind of uh, in terms of strengthening um, kind of the non-facility. Uh, if we can move to the next slide. Can I ask a oh, certainly. I just have a quick question. I know that you're not in charge of this, but did the aerial spraying actually happen yesterday? Oh, you're right. We don't have anything to do with that. I, I wouldn't know. It was delayed. It was delayed. And from what I understand, because I went on the website, it, it's supposed to take place over the course of several days, three days or so. But I think yesterday it's got delayed, so it could be today, tomorrow. I think <coughs> it said that in the memo, too, depending on the weather and the, yeah. the winds and such. So, yeah. And they'll be giving you notice, maybe a little bit more notice, or? No, I don't think so. I, if I was a betting woman, I'd say that was it. Yeah. 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 And it was classified as an emergency waiver. And, and I think it was emergency because if you take a look, you can see that it was very quickly pulled together, like there are some typos in there and as such that normally that, that's not the kind of thing that comes out of DEP or um, any of the state departments. And so I think, I think they decided that we need to do this, we need to do this now, and here it is. And schools, here it is. So that's how I took it. So I don't suspect or anticipate that we will be receiving anything more from them. I think but that was it. Evening only? Evening application? It is. Beginning at around 7.30 through 4.30 okay. in the morning. Okay. Yeah. Okay. yeah. Like we've also done some additional things too. I mean, we've made sure that we've pulled <laughs> all of the extra toys, for example, that were outside mm -hmm. in, and we've done things like that that, yeah, far too many details for around this table right now, but we have we took extra measures as well. Okay. Uh, for uh, str uh, strengthening for the facilities, that's a little bit uh, different. Um, we'll just go into the first bullet. Thank you. Lisa and Rob will talk to you shortly about the repeater additions. We are so excited to say that this is the direction that we're, be, we're moving in. Our chiefs have been asking for this for long before I came here. And um, Lisa will talk to you about a grant that they worked on together with our police departments. We received it and now a repeater will be in every building and they can give you more details when they come to talk about that. But I'm so proud of the work that our staff did with the police and I'm proud to say that we are going to have these in all at every one of our buildings from now on. So that's very exciting. Additional service and switches. This was part of um, a town town votes that that came forward this year on the town warrants um, in Stowe and Lancaster. Uh, we were in a good place with already with Bolton, so Bolton didn't need to to up theirs, but the others did, and so this will help to, to uh, put us in a good position because. Rob has shared with you before, but he will probably allude to it again tonight, the fact that we've got a several years plan in place, and this was the first step. I think it's like a three-year plan. This was the first step that we needed before we could move into the second plan and the third plan, the third phase of it. And so we've had that discussion with the town administrators. Everybody knows where we're at with it, including we've brought this up with our FinComs, and we've had conversations with them prior to the town meetings. So I think everybody was in a good place uh, for that. So that's done, and I believe all the services switches are now in place within the district as, uh, over the summer. 
the window film I'm not going to go into a lot of detail with that with that but I would tell you that that was one of the things you'll recall those of you who've been sitting on the school committee for a couple of years you'll remember that a couple of years ago we did a full comprehensive review a safety review of every school in and building in the district and then we were able to take that glean from that and that's where the as I was talking about earlier the cameras and such the switches and servers that was all part of that review and so we sat down and uh, took a look at it and prioritized it with their support the, the help of the company who did it um, one of the things that came forward was the the notion of applying appropriate window film it is not bulletproof but it is shatterproof is that how we can term it, term it? Um, and we have placed it on um, a number uh, a fair number of windows and doors across the district this summer um, it because it's not bullet necessarily bulletproof but the fact that what it does do is it slows the potential entry and so that kind of helps our responders and again Rod will speak to that too uh, tonight we did add a couple of additional cameras where we felt we absolutely needed to um, and those are now installed as well Rob may mention that too and the window and door numbering you can't well, I guess you can't imagine how big a project that was in a school district our size to have every single window and door numbered inside and out. And so it, there is absolute logic to it. It was very thoughtful on how it was done. And again, with our police uh, safety partners. So basically, if we we know that something is happening in room, I don't know, 13A, everybody know again the police can go on see exactly where it is and know exactly where to go so we feel very comfortable that was that was a huge project that really took us almost a year to complete so thrilled with that water update um, so <clears throat> the, there was a story if you saw it in the Boston Globe and I'm going to allude to that here shortly um, and I know that um, our own local papers are doing a story on it as well. But let me just give a couple of salient points and then Rob will speak on it um, again when he comes to talk. So we, we moved forward. I'm going to say, uh, Rob, again, you can correct me, probably around May or so. We voluntarily, May, June, we voluntarily tested for, for PFAS. And there's a lot, if you're doing any homework or research in this area, there's a lot of things that fall under that. I think there's like two, over 2,000 elements that fall into it. Our company is Whitewater, who's the vendor that we work with, that we're on contract with. They, they test for five uh, of the key, the, the key ones, and um, the Mass DEP, I believe, tests for six. So our numbers are a little bit different between the Whitewater numbers and Mass DEP, but we expected that. We all expected that that would happen. Uh, so again, I know that we had a parent call and ask us about it, and we just looked at each other and said, it wasn't really because a parent called, it's just it makes sense for us to be proactive because I said, if one parent is calling, that means other parents are thinking about it. We should be thinking about it. Why don't we be proactive with this? And then at least we have a gauge and we know exactly what's going on. Primarily in Bolton and Stowe because they're, they're well water. Lancaster's in a different position because you're, you're on town water. And that really falls to the purview of, of your town administration and your DPW. But uh, I'll touch base with that a little bit further in a minute. So we went after Bolton and Stowe first because they're all well water, and that's where we were where we were looking. This is long before Deep Mass TV ever came into our world because they weren't even on our radar at that point in time. So we tested it. Bolton came back with I think zero detect, right? Absolutely zero. So we weren't worried about that. And by the way, Lancaster, I believe you get some of your water from Bolton area. So we felt that you probably were kind of safe. But with that. We have still asked for a voluntary water test anyway. New Town knows that we're doing that. Um, so we knew that we knew that Bolton was okay. We thought probably Lancaster was okay. We weren't as sure about Stowe. So Stowe's water came back and whatever the parts are. I think the acceptable rate now is I want to say 70 parts per trillion. They came back around that 20 to 30 parts. So we knew that we were well under and fully in compliance with the, that particular number. With that, uh, though, came, you know, we'll keep our eye on this and see if it, we didn't expect it to necessarily change a whole lot, but we'll keep our eye on it. Then we got a phone call from Mass DEP that said, 
hey, we're voluntarily, voluntarily asking, does anybody want to have their water tested? And we said, well, we actually have had our water tested, so I think we're in a good place. They said, well, why don't we test it too? So we looked at each other and said, sure. <laughs> we already knew what the number was coming from white water. They said, well, our number would probably be a little bit different because we test for, I believe, one more. And we said, well, that's fine. But yeah, sure, let's go ahead and do this. So then they did, the, they did it, they got their results back, and we took a look, and it was, again, very, very close. I think theirs was just a little bit higher than ours was, but not like 10 or 20. It wasn't anything like that. It was just a little bit more. So we knew that Mass DEP was looking at potentially changing that 70 parts per trillion to a different number. So we have no idea, sitting here tonight, what that number will, will be, we suspect because there's grapevine scoop out there, not that anybody has told us this specifically, we are guessing though it's probably going to be around that 18 to 25 parts mark. If that's the case, then Stowe will then be out of compliance. We looked at it and said it makes sense for us to do something right now. Why, why wait until somebody comes along with a new number? We have no idea, by the way, when that will happen. But why wait? We might as well say, okay, we've got a, a PFAS issue here right now. Let's be proactive <clears throat> with it. And as Tom Hull says, we're always proactive anyway. This should be just one more thing that we're being proactive in. So that's what we did. So um, we brought water in, and I, I said at the time, I, because it was so close to the opening of school, I didn't know if we could get everything in place, but I said, like, let's not race through this. We do everything else thoughtfully. Let's be thoughtful with it. The water hasn't changed from like last week to this week. It's not going to change anymore. Let's just be thoughtful with this and get get water in, however, whatever that looks like. But I think we managed to get all the water in place in the Stowe schools for the first for the first day of school. We sent a memo out to staff when we sent a memo out to our students, and we encouraged our students to um, bring their own bottles of water from home. And I know when <laughs> Ross uh, Malkaren did their first day back at Center School and asked how many of you brought water. I think it was 99.5% of the students had brought water in from home. Rob is continuing to look at this. We also, we met several times with the town administrator. As I said, we met, we met with the, um, your Stowe members of representatives from the Board of Health and Neshoba representative. And we had our whole team there that has anything to do with this. So Rob was there, Lisa, our principals, Tom Poole was there, Pat was there, um, Todd was there. We were all there in case they had any questions that I couldn't answer that you might have had a piece of or somebody else might have had a piece of. Um, that was a very good meeting, very respectful of the approach that the, the Stowe Board of Health um, took with us, um, very appreciative of working in partnership with them. We also did took one step further and we asked for a meeting with Kate Hogan, um, and that's because she she's avidly and actively involved and interested in this particular issue, so it made sense for us to sit down with her, as a, again, as a small group of people, uh, of, of leadership members, we did that and had a very good meeting with her. So I felt that we were in a good position to move forward. I think that our parents have been fabulous. Um, we did have the Boston Globe come to do a story. Um, I think that he maybe was looking for a different story than was present. I am so appreciative and respectful of our Stowe parents and how they dealt with that, that particular reporter. Um, I don't think that they could have done one thing better. And when the article came out, it was pretty factual and there wasn't a lot of um, a lot of spin or story that really wasn't there. One of the things that Kate Hogan mentioned to us and um, when we've talked with others is for people to realize that this is something that's happening in real time. We don't have a lot of answers right now and I think that that's one of the things I respected about the Stowe parents who corresponded with us, they realized that this is something that's happening in real time. And even the fix to fix this is happening in real time. Like we're working right now with Mass DEP to find the best fix we can find for those two schools. They will be marginally different, uh, but I think in the last week what we've realized is probably more similar than we had anticipated. At first we thought it was gonna be starkly different. It's not looking that way now as we move closer to whatever that fix looks like. Um, so that's kind of where we're at with that. So that's a lot of safety things. So, um, 
Regarding uh, the water in Stowe, uh, the students have been asked to bring in water, and we had, you had mentioned to me at one point about water used um, in the kitchens. Yeah. It has, and, and what the workaround for that was going sure. to be. So if you could talk about that and then what the potential budget impact would be. Well, the potential budget impact is easy because the answer is we don't know. Okay. So we honestly <laughs> don't know right now. And we can't even guess. We know that the engineering right now is going to be about $4,500 for the two schools. But we don't know what thereafter because it depends on whatever the fix is going to be for this. Rob's also been communicating with Hudson uh, because they have just, I, I met with uh, their superintendent yesterday morning and they right now just got back um, uh, a no detect in their water finally, which is great. That's where we would like to be. I don't know if we can get there, but that's only, you're always aiming for excellence. So are you bringing water in for the day-to-day -day -day operation of the kitchens? Absolutely. So thank you for bringing that up too. I appreciate that. So if you were to take a look um, in our kitchens right now, they have huge... I don't know, is it five gallon? Five gallon um, bottles that sit in the sink with pumps on them. Anything that's being, I mean, we've taken a number of different um, uh, different activities uh, with regards to this. For example, if we're having pasta or rice or anything that would absorb PFAS, that is being cooked off site and being trucked down 117 to um, the, the stove schools. So if it, if it absorbs it. Um, vegetables don't, so it's okay to, you know, with uh, Mass DEP guidelines, it's okay to use it for vegetables and such. But right now, quite frankly, we're not using it for our vegetables either. We're using the bottled water for that kind of thing too. Uh, one of the other things that I hadn't even thought of, and this is why it's, we've got such a great team to work with, is one of the ways of keeping our food warm is through steam. And we've shut that down. So there's no steam running in our ovens anymore. So, and all of, um, all of our water fountains have all been either clipped off, like they've got a, a little thing in. Rob can speak to that certainly, but I'm sharing so much of it. Probably Rob won't have anything to say. What he does. We've got clips on them. They found some really neat little things there that just shut them down. Uh, those that we couldn't shut down have been turned off. And if we couldn't do that, they've been wrapped in plastic. And there are water tables set up throughout the schools with cups and uh, the, the water bottles. So, yeah. Super. All right, thank you. Any other Anything else on safety right now? Yeah. Um, will we hear later from Rob? Yeah, the report uh, yeah. on kind of the projections on timelines yeah. and things of that sort. Okay. Yeah. I have a quick question. Yes, uh, I'm, I'm sorry, Brooke, I, may, I may have missed this when you were going through the, the safety uh, informational items. So it's police access to cameras. What what, what is that? So, it, it basically, like our camera systems in our buildings um, have previously, like last year, for example, Lancaster police could only see Lancaster schools. They couldn't see anybody else's school. And what they the police chiefs collectively came and said, "Listen, if something happens at any Neshoba school, we will all be there. It won't just be Stowe in Stowe. Like Lancaster Police will be in Stowe as well. And so they wanted to be able to access and see where the issues were, so they all knew where they were going. I hate to quick follow up. Okay, okay, so I'm a little bit confused about that. So, I, I was not aware of what you just said. So the Lancaster Police have video feeds to the police station for what's going on inside the school. If there's an emergency, it's not a it's not a full streaming. Oh, okay, that's, what that's yeah, okay. We couldn't afford that. Okay. <laughs> well, even if they wanted it, we could we can't afford it. It's far too expensive. No, it's set up so that if there's a crisis, they go in. But for example, I think I think the the passwords for all three communities ran out, and they had to re up because nobody had gone in. So it's only if there's a crisis situation that they would be going in there. Otherwise, no, they don't as a rule. Other questions? Great question. Okay. 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 Thanks, Lena. Sorry. I'm gonna try. Uh, there's just a lot, so I'm gonna try to get through it as quickly as I can. Uh, Leachfield, Rob's okay. gonna talk about that as well and give you a little bit more detail. But that was a great summer project. I think we're 99.9% .9 complete right now. Yeah. Pretty close to that. Uh, he'll talk to you about the oil tank that's on order and some timelines on that. Uh, the MSBA application, we're waiting word on that. We haven't heard anything, um, so knock wood. We're waiting for December to come quickly. 
Um, one of the things that we're asking of the high school staff is that they spend some time this year looking at reflections on a new building or a dramatically changed building. Um, I won't go into any detail on that right now, but you will hear more about that as we go through the school year. Um, from there, I moved in on the first day into where we're, we're heading as a district with the, the district improvement plan, what that looks like. Uh, we had district improvement plans available the very first day for them. And then um, if they didn't pick one up there on site, we delivered them so that everybody had access to the district improvement plan. Um, last year, we had really focused on innovation and we, we looked at George Kuros' work, uh, the innovator's mindset. And as I had said to our staff, you know, the first two years we really worked at stabilizing the district, making sure whether it was fiscal, whether it was HR, whether it was bed, we really looked at stabilizing the district for the first two years. The third year is when we said, okay, we can start to stretch our thinking a little bit. What's that going to look like? And George Curls, I mean, tied in beautifully with the technology component that we were really focusing on and then just the out-of-box thinking and, and how we could positively look at things through a very different lens. And he was fabulous. As we looked this year, we were really looking to tie in George Curls' work and so continue that innovation, but tie it in with SEL, with the social emotional learning and what did that come together and look like. And so uh, Tony Wagner, we thought, was, um, would be, be a perfect tie in as we move next year into more of a full SEL. So that's why the district improvement plan, of course, is a two-year plan because we see this as kind of that springboard year to get us to the to year number two. So uh, one of the things that Tony Wagner really stresses that I also stress that day is the notion of going uh, play, passion, and purpose. And you, I know, Elaine, you brought that up the other day with me when we were talking. Um, he talks, uh, Tony Wagner talks about play being the childhood piece, passion coming at the adolescence, and the purpose coming at the adult. But I challenge our staff to think, and maybe it's just because I often think of this, as play, passion, and purpose as adults. You know, in, in terms of, it's okay for us to take something that we love to do, in my case it's education, and have that play piece, but then as an adult, I, I move back and forth, I vacillate back between the play, the passion I feel for the work that I do, and the fact that there has to be purpose. And that purpose is always for me, always being, even as a teacher, doing the very best for the children that I served. Whether it was in a classroom, as a teacher, a building, as a principal, or a district, as a school leader. Um, so I want to make sure that we keep that notion of play, passion, and purpose at the forefront of our efforts in all the work that we do in, within the district, not just as leaders, but as teachers and leaders. So that was kind of the uh, the thrust of that, and I think that is that it. Do we have, uh, that's it for slides, right? So that gives us a, a broad <coughs> overview of the day. I know Kathy, you were there because you were able to give some uh, some uh, good, wonderful, welcoming words to us, and I know Todd, you were there. So um, as leaders, you may want to kind of chime in and offer a thought or two uh, on the first day. If I've missed anything, certainly. I just wanted to talk about the vibe of the room. It was always took me back to first day of, of school as a, as a teacher and as an administrator and the sense that um, that you know people are a little nervous no matter how long you've been working it's also exciting to see everybody everybody looks about 10 years younger and um, you know have recharged their batteries um, but also I thought the opening presentation was very well done um, certainly the stuff that you presented the video, and then um, Todd and Teaching and Learning speaking to uh, the different initiatives um, this year. And um, I think it, it moved, it didn't get stalled anywhere because teachers, secretaries, everybody just want to get back into their buildings yeah. and get started. And, and so I thought it was a good um, introduction to the school year. And thank you. Thank you. And thank you, Todd, for the work you guys did. Thanks. And thank you, Alita, because it wouldn't have happened without you <laughs> making sure of people's organizations. Thanks. Todd, any thoughts from you? Yeah, no, I mean, it was a great opening day. Um, the vibe was, was wonderful. I think teachers were really excited. Um, there was a lot of po positive energy um, in the room. And I think we set up our building leaders and our principals at our administrative retreat um, with a lot of resources and tools mm -hmm. to really focus on that social-emotional element. 
Um, part of the reason why we're bringing Tony in is because it really is a nice dovetail from George Kuros's work, really around um, innovation. But you know, Tony talks about the new skills that have really become more valuable and most valuable are those social emotional skills, such as cooperation and collaboration and motivation. Um, and we really want to focus on and giving our students those kinds of skills so that they can be really successful moving out of the out of academia. Um, so I, we're really excited about what, what the year um, what the year's going to bring bring for us, and really excited um, about Tony coming too. And I've talked with him several times, so um, we're excited about it. Yeah, it's gonna it was. Be, a, I think it was a great start to the school yeah. year. So and the feedback uh, was wonderful. Yeah, <laughs> feedback was excellent. The um, date for Tony Wagner is March tenth. Oh, March tenth. Sorry. Um, last year, Elaine and a few other folks from the school committee were there at the George Coros presentation. It, it was out, I thought it was outstanding. I cried. Um, yeah. <laughs> and um, I think we all cried after the bourbon commercial, which <laughs> was like a rope dope There's this very emotional thing, and a, kid, a, a guy learning English so he can read the book his son wrote, and there's not a dry eye in the place, and then at the end, they put their glasses, and it's a bourbon yeah. commercial. But they, the, the tea up was great. Um, so, March 10th, if March 6th, I'm sorry. I thought it was March 6th. Thanks, because I was just going to ask everybody to pencil Put it on their calendars. You know, so March, March 6th, 6th Friday, March 6th. Can go, and it's always the first thing. Um, that would be awesome. So just keep it in It's mind. a great day. Okay. Really Any great other day. questions or comments for Brooke or Tom? No? Okay. Great. Thank can you. We move on to the uh, business office update. And here comes Pat Maroney. How are you? Good, how Good are you? Good to see you. That's great. Hello, everyone. So, um, I think I'm going to do the um, request from the athletic director first. Somebody um, has it. Um, are you gonna do I that? have it. Yes. I mean, they have the motion. Somebody does. Oh, okay. We're a county designated. <laughs> So um, the, our athletic director, Tanya Rich, has requested that we donate a large lot of old football jerseys and helmets to the Neshoba Athletics Booster Club. Um, normally what we do with surplus equipment is we put it up on a site called Municipal and people are given the opportunity to bid on this, but um, within our community, um, we thought that this might be a better better idea for us. Um, Hi, can you explain what the Booster Club does? With the, the Booster <coughs> Club raises money for our athletics. But so they will sell these? These, they, yeah, and I'm getting okay, I'm sorry. <laughs> going on. Sorry. The Booster Club's intention is to sell the jerseys to players, fans, as a Booster Club event at games. So that's why it's important that I bring this to you right now Super. so that we can put them for sale at the football game. Um, the funds raised will then be used to support our athletes, as the Neshoba Athletics Booster Club has done for so many years. Um, the school committee policy states that we can donate surplus <coughs> items to a 501c organization with a two-thirds school committee approval. And the Neshoba Booster Club is a 501c3 organization. So I'm... Um, Requesting a motion tonight, and I can. Uh, can I have a motion, please, Steve? I move that uh, we authorize the donation of excess and old equipment to the Neshoba High School Booster Club for their purposes to support the athletes. Thank you. A second, please. Second. Second. Okay. Thank you, Leah. <laughs> Any questions or further discussion? Okay, all those in favor? Opposed? Okay, thank you. Thank you. Okay. Next up, some slides. <coughs> so what, I'm, what I have in front of you is a, just a couple of slides in regards to our chapter 78 for fiscal year 20. So for Neshoba, our fiscal year chapter 70 A, our fiscal year 20 chapter 70 A um, budgeted amount is $7,218,771. Um, right now the state is um, projected to fund 
$7,273,744,000, which is an increase of about $54,973. So um, anyway, uh, this, is a, this is good news. This is a little bit more than we usually get as an increase. You know, usually it's about $20,000 and that's about it, but we got a little bit more this year. So I, I just want to also say that this is projected. This could change because we know that the way, you know, the way that our legislature works, they change things around all the time, they move money around. And so right now we're hoping that this will hold true, you know, and that they will um, honor their commitment to the schools and, and giving us this number they hope best with that. I've also um, provided you with a slide. It, it's um, from the Department of Education, and it will give you kind of a comparison of fiscal year 19 and fiscal year 20 <coughs> and the changes. I mean, you can access um, more detail on this information on the um, Jesse website. So if anybody has any questions about anything here. I think, the, uh, I think we just want to be cautious here. I know that right now it looks like we've got, we've got 50,000 more, but Pat and I were saying we've both experienced years where that hasn't come through. And so we just, we're letting you know just as a point of information, that's all this is. It's not that you plan for another teacher, well, it wouldn't be for another teacher, or another whatever, because you just can't count on that. Um, Mike? Assuming that money does come through, right? I, I absolutely understand where you're coming from, and I want to jump to conclusions. Where would that money live? Or it could be used for what purposes might it might be. Ultimately, it ends up in E and D. But if if it was left over, you know, like Pat will be bringing recommendations next meeting for for funds to go into E and D. That's where that would ultimately land. If it wasn't used, but again, it's way too early in the year to even think yeah. about this because we really don't even like. I mean, we might have one payroll under our belt right now. Do you know what I mean? Like we were, now it's not really a good time yet for us to even think about potentially. But to your point, Mike, if it's left over, then Pat would bring a recommendation to the school committee like she will next meeting. Yeah. Right, and I'll, I'm going to bring everything for fiscal year 19 that I have at this point. Um, it's not audited, but it's pretty much where we, we stand at the end of fiscal year 19, so. And, and when, when will the, the chapter 70 funds Come into come the in, district. Yeah. They come in monthly. Okay. They break it up, and if they if there was an adjustment, they would adjust it. You know, about mid year. You know, if they um, mid academic year. Yes. Okay. Yeah, around January. Okay. Or so, the end of January. So. Elaine, did you have a question? Uh, yes, and and you may feel more comfortable speaking about this in the next meeting after what you just said. But mm -hmm. um, in a similar process, question. I know that there's going to be an FY19 supplemental budget. It's not completed. The governor announced Correct. his version still has to go through the legislature. But like in previous years, when there's a supplemental budget that comes out, mm -hmm. is that money ever planned to be used for something? Or does it go straight into E&D? Is it similar to this where well, it's sort of a bonus? or Typically, like if it was to be part of fiscal year 19, um, I think that <coughs> The Department of Revenue has said that they were going to allow us to almost like encumber it into the previous fiscal year. But I'm not even sure whether or not that's going to happen. So I, I don't even want I don't even want to go down that road at this point. It's very confusing. It's it's part of um, uh, it's part of the E and D certification and whether or not they let us include it. And our E and D. Yeah, I don't know if they would or not. 19. I think there's a lot. I That's think there are a lot of questions that it would be asked. So we have, we've not been in that position yet. So we'll see. But ultimately, we think of things like <coughs> E and D funds, right. and not as well. We're hoping something comes through, and this is where we would place it. Mm -hmm. Like you don't even have those discussions, right? Oh no, like, that kind of discussion we have all the time. Oh, okay. I mean, for example, you look forward, and I had mentioned this before too. And I mean, free full day K is on our mind all the time, you know, because um, I, I think once you move beyond the philosophical, uh, is this something to do or not, then that money piece comes in behind it, right? And you have to say, okay, so how are we going to pay for that gap here? Well, right now we know that we've basically got 
ha probably about half of what we need set aside for that. Well, we still have a little bit here that we need to go. We know that every year that we don't do this, we're losing out on state funding. <laughs> So for us, it makes sense that you say, okay, at some point in time, we, we probably should talk about this sooner than later, right? So we have those of those kinds of, I mean, that's an example of a discussion that's happening all the time in our offices we're watching. That's not the only discussion, but that's, I think, is that what you're asking? Is it like those those types of discussions? Yeah, you're at that yeah. level. Okay. We're, we're always talking about that. So that's yeah. about it. That's all I have. Any other questions? Steve? It's not a question, but I think, I think we have to realize because there's, there's always a lot of uh, publicity about them redoing the foundation algorithm. Mm -hmm. And if they redo the foundation algorithm, the odds are we're going to lose money rather than gain money because they're going to cycle that money to poorer school districts. And we would not. So looking ahead and trying to figure out, oh, how much money we're going to get mm -hmm. is not a good idea. I think we have to live in the moment. Yeah. Yes. I think the, the fiscal yeah. moment. Yeah. But exactly. you're right. We don't know. There's too much we don't know. Put right it as soft of an impact yeah. as possible. Yeah. yeah. And that's what we're planning for. Any other questions or comments? Okay, Pat, thank you so much. You're welcome. And now we're going to hear from Lisa Gubicki. Mm -hmm. Me. And welcome to all new members. I see the faces around. I wasn't here for the first meeting then, but thank you for having me. Um, I'm talking about a few grants that we received um, this year. Um, first one is Comprehensive School Health Service Grant that we applied for. Um, the goal is to implement a comprehensive interdisciplinary approach to student health in order to address school-based health prevention and promotion programs like substance abuse, reproductive health, or oral health. Those are just some suggestions. Um, also support for students with chronic health conditions, diabetes, and a big focus on the shift of mental health, um, as well as to address health disparities and racial inequalities, um, homelessness, poverty, and access um, to care in order to improve student attendance and academic achievement. Um, more importantly, the grant is also used to implement a, a re-entry program or a bright bridge program, which they call um, a specific one called Bright, um, for students returning to academics after an extended absence for reasons such as post-hospitalization, rehabilitation, or recovery from the concussion <clears throat> in order to successfully return to learning. Um, we started that process even prior to the grant being received last year and um, had a subcommittee that got together and looked at what our reentry looks like and um, we're trialing that paperwork now in a protocol um, to see if that fits into the, what our goals were. <coughs> the program will work to establish targeted integrated supports for students whose learning has been significantly impeded by serious mental health and or other medical challenges. We were awarded um, for the first four years of $75,000 a year with that money, um, we were able to hire somebody for a .6 position um, and also have funds to be utilized in order to support the program throughout the year. Um, at the end of that four years, um, they will look at if we're meeting the goals and guidelines. It's uh, very comprehensive of what um, they want the goals to be. Um, and if we are, there's potential to continue for another four years after. And this also ties back in with the SEL and our, our so, focus on this. Yeah. But I, I'm thrilled. That's a yeah. lot of money to, to get. I know that it's targeted money, that it has to be spent on very specifics, very specific. but very specific to what we needed. So sure. it was just it was just a hand in glove moment, you know. So I'm thrilled and we've hired someone and she's started already. It, as of day six, we had a pretty extensive caseload already. So we're in, we're in the infancy stages of how this is going to look over time. Um, and I just, you know, asked, um, we're starting mostly at the high school, but we have cases in other schools as well to start off with. Um, but we want to be thoughtful of the process and not just jump in and not have a plan of what it looks like. Um, since it's a four-year plan, we really want to um, make sure how we can support students currently right now um, and, and we're off and running so it's mm -hmm. um, we're actually um, some of the funds as well is a professional development day we're going to have all social workers guidance counselors nurses um, and adjustment counselors um, attend a two-day training it's called prepare training and that'll start on that first two professional development days so we have over 40 of us that will be there and that looks at the trauma-informed brain, what it looks like, how we prepare for crises, and how to um, de-escalate. 
the, the only other uh, add-on I'd say too is certainly in, in every year, uh, I'm sure Lisa, you can probably speak to the same thing and or, or uh, other educators around the table. I remember way back when, when we really didn't have uh, students out for uh, hospitalization like we do now. And every year that <laughs> number grows more and more significantly. And uh, I, you know, when you say we were off and running, I know that you were um, because we had we had students hospitalized in the summer that we're yeah. dealing with. So it it happens. I think that people don't realize just how much it happens, but it, it does happen quite a, quite a bit. Yeah, and it allows us to do a lot of home visits as well. We've already done um, quite a few. It's only how many days in school <laughs> um, that we've done um, home visits, and we have plenty of those scheduled as well to help support families. So, any questions on that grant? Question. Yes. You were oh, saying excuse me. Yes. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> um, you said that. The bright, are you calling it the bright program? The, there is a, that's one program that they want us to look at. It's, it's a bridge program. It's um, what that looks like in um, some uh, high schools that have implemented it already. It's almost like that in between. Um, so when they're coming back from a post hospitalization, they go to a safe room. Um, we have something very similar already. So we're, we're already ahead of the game um, with our um, academic learning center. It kind of mimics that same thing that they have an area, a safe, Place to before they can streamline back into the classroom. So we were already there. It's a matter of supporting that and giving it more support that may be needed. And so the, the point six position you were talking about is being added to what is already there? No, not to that program. This The point six position is, um, it's a nurse um, that will do home visits and um, look at re-entry, connecting outside communities with us now. What currently happens if somebody's been hospitalized, a lot of times we don't receive information. Um, until right before they're coming back to school. And this is going to start that process earlier to be able to go to these facilities and actually be part of their discharge plan and come back in. And they also work on programs for social and emotional learning, um, anxiety, um, things to get kids to come to school um, that are having difficulty getting through the front doors because of their mental health. Other questions? Thanks, Lisa. Thanks. Thanks. So um, another um, grant as we continue with the work that Brooke uh, mentioned earlier with um, safety 2019-2020, um, Rob and I, <laughs> help me if I miss anything, um, spent a lot of time um, along with Pam Sedalsta. She was really instrumental in helping with resources. Um, she reached out to um, law enforcement, um, Everett down in Lancaster and others. Um, Peter from Beltronics um, helped us write this grant in order to receive it. Um, the application was submitted and we awarded um, $62,230. Um, for we had, were in connection with all three police and fire chiefs um, that really wanted this and it's for the repeaters and communication linking systems for all three um, school um, three towns um, for the districts. Um, it's a public safety linking community inclusive of repeaters, linking system, radios and licensing. And what that means is that we they would be able to communicate um, our principals or administrators in the building at the time would be able to communicate via radio to any Lancaster store or Bolton, depending on what the situation or emergency that's happening. Um, something that, as, as Brooke had mentioned, um, the police and fire were looking for for quite a few years. years. Um, and it was uh, Chief Nelson that brought it to me one day and said, do you want to meet on Monday morning and discuss this grant? And he handed it to me and I said, I think it's great. He says, okay, let me know how it goes. So, <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Chief Nelson, but he's the one that brought it to us, and um, we had a week and a half to write it, and I'm, I'm very proud of the team that worked on it. Um, I couldn't have done it without Rob and Pam. We were, it, was, it was really a, a collective team, and um, Peter from Beltronics, because I, for the longest time, I said, I don't even know what a repeater is, but we'll keep writing it. <laughs> um, but it worked out well. I think one of the concerns the police had was particularly the high school, yeah. and that just the way the high school is built, and this will take that will take all of that away. Now there won't, there won't be any more concerns with the high school yeah. on communication. Really exciting, and this has been an issue of long standing. I remember back in 2016 that it was an issue because of the poor cell phone service, mm -hmm. but the cost was prohibitive. So um, congratulations on getting the grant, and this is just another added layer of safety and security for the staff and students. Thank you. Yeah. Um, just two more quick things. Um, this, <laughs> Rob and I will be working on another grant um, coming up that will be for next year and we're going to bring the um, 
um, the objectives or goals of that grant um, or the stipulations of it um, to the Emergency Response Task Force. We do have law enforcement um, and safety committee members from each school that attend that meeting um, and really look at from each building and what would be the next priority for us as a school district and obviously we would bring that um, to Brook and Talk before we move forward to make sure that that's where we want to be as well as fire and police. Um, we, we always partner with them when we're looking at what we're going to do district-wide as far as um, safety initiatives, but we'll, we'll be bringing that to the first meeting in October um, to see what, what our next move would be for that. Mm -hmm. We have some ideas. We also have a, um, coming down the line, I've been, um, I have a meeting on October 9th with the Board of Trustees from the Alice Eaton Trust Fund. Um, that is for um, Stowe. Um, they've reached out to me, it's been since January, we've been working back and forth but for months now um, on um, certain things that we could use funds for. Um, some of them are a library resource geared towards social and emotional for students and parents, a library, classroom <coughs> audio technology, new hearing and vision equipment since they were last purchased in 2000, <laughs> um, other health service equipments, um, diabetes camps, and family education support. Um, we're looking at doing some after school six session classes for parents and other family and caregivers of children and adolescents who have either been diagnosed with a mental health condition or experiencing symptoms but that have, may not have been diagnosed yet. Um, so we're looking um, right around, around 50,000 for that. And we'll be meeting in October to find out if we qualify. We've been going back and forth and they're really interested and this is the next move for us to meet with the trustees. That's terrific. Awesome. That's great. <coughs> Thank you. <laughs> Then I think the thing we have left is the physician contract. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, so do you have any? Do you want to speak to it or? Yeah, because I'm sure that we because we've got new members, they wouldn't even. Yes. Oh, know the physician about contract. This. Oh, yeah. okay. Yes. I'm sorry. So every year um, we sign a contract with our. We have a physician consult, Dr. Coleman, out of Pediatric West. Um, he consults um, as often as as I want. It's it's um, a contract for the year. He signs all of our standing orders. He signs our orders um, for EpiPen so we can obtain those for NAPCAN in our schools. Um, and we consult with him anytime uh, an administrator, um, e even Brooke herself says, you know, can you pass this past the um, physician? Um, we can ask questions and he consults with us to make sure that we're doing best practices um, and we're, we're responding to parents and students in an appropriate manner. Um, also, um, um, standing orders, consults, and I think that's, that's basically, yeah, it's a majority of what we do. It's a very valuable piece of the very, work that we do. He so. signs all the athletic, um, at the beginning of the year, he has to sign all the wrestling forms um, for Tanya, so I bring that to him. So he does a lot for us throughout the year, and no matter what I ask him for, he's more than willing. Uh, and he gets back to us in a very timely very time. fashion, very timely. Very responsible. He looks over protocols as well. So protocols, we did three new ones last year, asthma, diabetes, and medication administration. Um, we have him review them, he makes suggestions on them, and then we edit it based on he's the last one. We have everybody else look at it, and then that's the last um, set of eyes for our and, um, How long has Dr. Coleman been our the district's physician? I don't I don't know. Before, before I work in high. So. Okay, so he's one of long standing. Yes. 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 Okay. Yes. Okay, any questions for Lisa about the uh, physician's contract? Do you have the original one? This might be the original. Okay. You have it? Has oh, okay. Sorry. Okay, it, so was, the, it was in the material. Yeah, it was in the material. Oh, they all have it. Yeah, yeah. No. yeah they've all so it. I need a motion I to authorize. <laughs> to authorize <laughs> the. Selena just gave it all to me. I <laughs> okay, go ahead. Okay. I move to authorize the superintendent to sign the 2019-2020 physicians contract between the district. And Dr. Russell Coleman. Dr. Coleman will receive a $2,000 stipend under the terms of the contract. <coughs> I think we're getting them for a bargain basis. Thank you, but don't put that into the. <laughs> <laughs> uh, can I have a second, please? Second. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Any more questions or discussion? Comments? <coughs> Lisa, I want to thank you so much. The, the work that you have done has just been amazing in the last thank couple you. of years. And um, these grants, these are not small grants, these are enormous. Grants Thank you. and just so appreciative of all you do for our district. Thank you. Thank you. Um, all in favor? Opposed? Okay, I would echo the superintendent's Thank words you. and I hope that, um, you know, these are the types of things that we'd like to showcase for the communities that there are 
substantial grants that we get, and these are all wonderful things on behalf of the students. So thank you, and Rob, for your work. Thank you. Okay. Okay. So, Rob, this should be quick. It should be. <laughs> Thank you, Brooke. Thank you, Rob, take all the time. No rush. It's good to see everybody. Hope everybody had a good summer. Um, it was a busy summer for us in the facilities department. Uh, I'll start off with the leach field. The project started on July 1st. Um, everything started off pretty smoothly um, until they got to started subsurface digging um, <coughs> in one of the corners of the actual leach field itself. They found a large debris field. Um, I think when they pro po possibly were clearing some soccer fields or some land, they dumped all the stumps and everything in that area. Um, so working with DEP, on-site engineering, and construction dynamics, we were able to uh, adjust the orientation of the leach field in a very short period of time. So there was really no disruption as far as the, the timeline of the construction went. Um, as of right now, we're about 95% complete. Um, all the disturbed areas have been hydroceded. The new pump and um, control panel will be installed next Wednesday, uh, September 18th. DEP will give us final approval. We'll bring the system online hopefully later in the day if, on the 18th if everything goes smoothly or it'll be on the 19th. Um, and then the project will be complete at that point. Um, and hopefully get some favorable weather and get some grass growing. So, um, it was a good project. You know, a couple little hiccups here and there, but it pretty smooth for the most part. Um, a little update on the oil, oil tank. The project will hopefully start Monday or Tuesday this coming week. Um, the SIN environmental was out today to do the uh, preliminary layout of where the pad and the oil tank is going to is going to sit behind the high school. Um, the lead time should have the tank arriving around the first week of October. Um, everything should be in place to have the tank dropped on the pad, and then the connections and the wiring um, and for the pipe will be made after that. There is a contingency plan in place for a temporary tank in the event that you know something gets delayed. Um, so that way we'll have smaller temporary tanks in place to have oil in there so we can get the, the heating season underway if you know we get into that time period. Um, hopefully it goes as smooth as the you know the beach field and everything goes goes right along. Um, touch base on the safety upgrades over the summer, like Superintendent Clutchy said, um, the remaining servers and switches that hadn't been upgraded were installed. Uh, everything is in operation um, and it's for preparation of the multi-year. Uh, security camera upgrade that we're going to put forward to the towns for the capital projects. Um, we did do some camera upgrades that we felt were necessary in the district, um, which are online now. And the quality of cameras that they have now is amazing compared to what we have. Um, I was talking to Chief Nelson yesterday because we had a meeting with him, and you know we were looking at a couple of the new cameras and just how clear and everything. I and mean, we were picking stuff up in the grass basically, where the other cameras are very, you know, they're not foggy, but just the, they're pixelated. Um, so it would be good to start making those upgrades. Um, we have made security enhancements to some of the doors and windows in all the buildings across the district, like Superintendent Clinchy said. Uh, we've added a window film with a structural caulking uh, that holds that film in place. So if somebody was to try to penetrate the window or door, it holds the glass in place and it allows for first, first responders more time to get here um, so that way uh, the intruder can't access the building. Uh, working with Omni and Protection Group, um, you know, we strategically laid out those windows and doors, uh, also taking into account the ALICE program in the evacuation. One of the aspects of that is evacuation. Um, so taking all in, you know, all that into play and, and laying out you know, the, the plan for all the windows and doors. Um, to kind of recap on leases um, and Superintendent Clenchy's um, remarks on the repeater system. Um, we're working with Peter Go uh, Gobi at Beltronics. We're going to have a repeater and an antenna on every single building in the district. So we'll have intercommunication, um, radio communication from one end of the district to the other. So all administration um, can talk to each other via radio with direct link to police and fire. So if there's ever a mutual aid response, um, there'll be a direct communication for a central command unit. Whoever's, you know, whoever's taking control of that. So it'll be a seamless communication across the district. Um, there won't be any lapse in communication for a better response time. Um, that hopefully, it, it's a very, it's, it's a robust system. Um, like I said, the repeaters and the tenors are going in right now. There's a fair amount of programming that has to go along with that. Um, so as things come on, you know, come online, it's um, hopefully 
from what Peter says, we're anticipated in late fall we should be up and running with that. Um, that's it for security updates. PFAS obviously is you know a hot topic right now that we have going on. Um, you know, I don't have to go too much back into detail from what Superintendent Clenchy said, um, but I did have a conversation with Northeast Geoscience, who we're working with, that's the engineering firm we're working with. Um, as of today, he is about 99% done, wrapped up with the engineering, and he hopes to get that over to DEP by the end of the week for their approval. Um, part of the filtration system we're going to be doing is it's a granulated activate, granulated charcoal, uh, activated charcoal in a, in a vessel that's similar size to a hot water heater. It's about two feet around, you know, 60, 80 inches in, um, high. And we're going to size the vessels based off the flow of water that we use in the school each day. Um, the first vessel will be, do the bulk of the work. It'll take the majority of the chemical out. The second one will finish it off to make sure, and we're, we're trying to get down to that no detect. Uh, there's no guarantee that we're going to get there, but that's what we're striving for. Um, if once we start testing after this has been installed, if we're at no detect rate, if we're not at no detect, we're going to it's going to be designed to add additional vessels so that we can get down to that no detect. Um, not knowing what DEP is going to come down with for a threshold, we don't even want to you know fool around with trying to get to a certain number. We just want to go right to no detect. Um, so that way it's it's easy for everybody. Yeah. Over and above Steve. the, I'm sorry, over and above oh, the, okay. Madam Chair. Steve, do you have a question? Yes. Uh, over and above the initial expense for the system, will the charcoal have to be periodically replaced and that will be an ongoing? It will, and I had a conversation with Joel over at Northeast Geoscience today and that was one of the questions that I asked him, you know, what's the, you know, replenish intervals and he said on similar systems that he's done, it's in the size system that we're putting in, you're looking at two years, around two years. Um, it's pretty dirty to go out and change all that, so we'll be contracting that out. Um, they have the right tools to get the job done. They'll come in three, four hours. You know, if we try to do that in house, we'd have to buy equipment. You know, it'd be a day's project. So, um, but I was happy to hear that. You know, it's, it should be around two years before we have to change that charcoal, oil, which would be nice. Um, up at the Hale School, we're going to have to do some Excuse retrofitting. Um, uh, sure, Mike, sorry. do you have a question? Yeah, um, <clears throat> I'm just curious. Do we have, um, have we historically tested for this compound? No, this is really brand new. And, uh, you know, at MassDEP would tell you it's really, it wasn't even on our radar until after 2016. So this is like brand new. This is like, and that's why I was saying earlier about the real time, the whole notion that we're just going through this. And because there's just, I think we are the first school district, which is why I think the Boston Globe picked it up to do what we're doing. So I think that that's one of the reasons why um, we didn't realize that at the time. We, you know, we just thought we were doing what was right for kids. So uh, does this represent uh, kind of a higher resolution of a suite of analytes that we'll be testing for from this point forward, or was this a one-off uh, and we just happened to catch it? Does that mean that? From this point forward, we're going to be testing on an annual basis just to make sure it doesn't kind of come back. Well, you're going to want to make sure that the I'm, I'm sure that we'll be testing regularly because yeah, we're going to make sure that mandate it. And yeah. he's going to come up with mandates. Uh, I'm guessing it's going to be <coughs> quarterly at first, um, and then you know as we get those test results back, if you know we continue on with the no detect, then we, I'm pretty sure we'll be able to back off on that to you know biannually or annually. So. We test out the water regularly, Mike, like yeah. regularly across the district. Yeah. I think Hale, isn't it? Like, <clears throat> right, almost, is it daily? We, well, Every other day? They, they monitor it daily, but with the new um, chemical injection system and the alarm system, they don't have to come every day with that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. so, um, so it's really regularly <clears throat> monitored. Great. Uh, Leah, did you have a question? I wonder if we or the DEP are searching for the costs. The cost? No. Oh, cost. cost. Oh no, that's pretty. That's. I think that's pretty well known out there. Yeah, I think if you if you go and look, um, and in fact, again, if you go into the Mass DEP website, there's a, there's a nice section right in there that explains it. So, and PFAS. Now, correct me if I'm wrong, or you or Lisa. I mean, there were things like, for example, fire suppression, uh, Teflon, a, a different. Um, companies, different, you know, whatever, manufacturing, different manufacturing companies and stuff, that's where this really comes from and it seeps into the soil and, it, you know, and it depends on like how close or how far you are away from one of those. So, I mean, there's a whole series of things, a series of ways that sourced this PFAS to begin with. 
Um, but with the Hudson example, mm -hmm. they have found culprits. That's right. So are we looking for specific situations or? Well, I think that that's one of the reasons why we were even on Mass DEP's radar, that Stowe was on Mass DEP's radar, is because of Hudson and because some of the activity and the old, uh, some of the activity that's happened in the past, like not present activity, but old historical activity, and that's where they think it may have started. So yes, I, I think that they have an, a, a good idea. Would they say right now, for sure that was it? No, again, because it's all in real time. So they had an inkling towards it, but I don't think anyone's prepared to say it's because X happened, that's why. But we're, we're convinced that it's not an ongoing problem, that it's, or not convinced, but what I'm wondering, I guess, is is something happening currently that's making it continue to be bad or even worse? Is the cause over and done with? They're, they're calling it a forever chemical, so because it's, <coughs> hydrofall, call it hydrophobic, and that might be the wrong word to use. Once it gets in the aquifer, nothing's going to break that down microbially or anything like that. Nothing, it's, it's there. So when it gets in the aquifer, it just moves freely through the aquifers. So it's, you know, it's just traveling as it goes. Um, you know, you did mention that, you know, they found, you know, the pollutant source over in Hudson. I think they are looking into that. Um, where that is, we don't know. But they don't know right now. They're not prepared. Like, we've asked that very question and uh, they're not prepared to give us an answer other than exactly what I'm giving, saying it could be a series of things. And would it be the town, the Board of Selectmen, who pursued this? This isn't something that the schools need to be managing, is it? No, it's a, no, no. I mean, we have to take care of our, no. our own situation, whatever that looks right. like, but I mean, the, the larger issue is not, it is not the school district's issue. Okay, other questions? Rob? Up at, Hale, <clears throat> up at Hale, we're going to have to make some modifications to the building <clears throat> where the well, um, the storage tank, and the chemical feed is housed. Um, there's a garage on back, and the garage is split down the middle. The water supply system is on one side, and then there's just a normal garage on the other side uh, that they use for storage. Um, th because of the size of the vessels, we're going to have to kind of take over that other side uh, to retrofit that to accept the vessels. Down at Center School, it's going to be a little bit more engineering involved with that. Um, we have a water softening system down there, and, and also the chemical feed system. And for the activated charcoal to work properly, um, all those systems have to be in the right order, um, so that way it doesn't eat up that activated charcoal. So we're basically going to have to retrofit the entire water system down at Center School um, before it goes into the storage tank. Um, so there's going to be a lot of piping. Um, you know, redoing the piping down in the boiler room there to make this you know, work properly. Um, I don't have numbers yet. Um, Northeast Geoscience is, has reached out to three different vendors uh, to work on pricing. So hopefully, you know, within the next week or week and a half, we should have pricing. Um, you know, for the installation of the vessels and the replumbing of everything. And the time frame, I know that that's going to come up as well, and you alluded to that a little bit earlier. We, because we're going to have to take the systems offline, it's going to have to be done, I'd like to say, over a long weekend. Um, you know, we're th targeting right now probably Thanksgiving break, um, because there's so many variables there. I don't think we could, even if we, I think we were in the right place, I don't think Columbus Day weekend would be enough time to get all this work done. Uh, it's going to take some time with all that plumbing. Um, you know, and that, I think that's where a large part of the cost will probably come from <clears throat> with overtime, you know, working on holiday weekends and stuff like that. Um, that's kind of what the mindset is right now, Thanksgiving, maybe they'll have to wait, you know, to the, to the Christmas break, um, just to try to, for the time, like I said, we're going to take the water completely offline in the buildings, uh, so we won't have, you know, water to the toilets and things like that. Um, so hopefully in the next week and a half, we'll have a lot more answers. I think we're in a pretty good place right now from where we were three mm -hmm. weeks ago. Definitely. Uh, so things move, moving along pretty good. Um, I think we want to give a shout out to Mass DEP too, who has, who has simply been amazing to work with. They really have been <coughs> so informative, so helpful, so supportive, so responsive. Yeah. So I, I think that they have been outstanding to work with. Anytime that I've reached out to them, you know, Brooke and well, all of us, we've reached out to them. And, you know, if they haven't answered the phone, we've gotten a phone call back almost immediately. Almost immediately. Mm -hmm. So they've been great with working with us. Touch base on mosquitoes real quick. Um, Obviously, you know, they're going to be doing some aerial spraying. We're taking some preventative measures on our end. Um, just before school started, two days before school started, we 
had a contract to grow, go out to spray all the tree lines. We're using a, a natural based product. It's uh, cedar oil and peppermint oil. Um, we're also we're going to be doing a second application on Saturday morning if it's not raining. We're going to try to do it sooner, but just with the logistics of parent drop off uh, and students being out there, it's about, it takes about six hours to spray the whole district. Uh, so logistically, it would have been a nightmare to try to do that. So Saturday morning, if the weather is cooperative, if not, they've agreed to come in on Sunday and, and treat it on Sunday, <coughs> which is great. Um, Gatsby Grounds, um, who we contract for our IPM program, they've been very great to work with. Um, touch base on the summer cleaning. Um, custodial staff has worked tremendously hard over the summer for the detail cleaning of buildings across the district. Uh, if anybody was to walk into any of these buildings, you know, shortly after school ends, leading up to 4th of July, you'd walk through and be like, how are they going to get this done? <laughs> I mean, it's it's the level of anxiety I have walking through the building, and I know what's going on. It's 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 amazing what happens, you know, in a short week, a period of time. The guys work very very hard. Um, you know, this this summer was much better than last summer weather wise. You know, we didn't have the heat and humidity that we had mm -hmm. last summer. Um, so for curing waxes and stuff like that, it definitely helped out. And just for overall morale with the team, you know, not being hot and just. Last summer was was challenging last summer, so the summer was a, almost a breath of fresh air. Um, as the heavy lifting starts to diminish, the custodial teams start to shift their gears and do little project work, repairing walls, painting. Um, the principals have you know task lists that they'd like to see get done over the summertime, so they work on projects um, for the principals and any of the staff in the building. Um, and my, again, my hat goes off to the whole facilities team. Uh, they hard work over the summer and during the school year. It's, just, it's it's amazing what these individuals get done, you know, to give the kids a, a clean and healthy learning <coughs> environment. So again, my hats go off, and go off to those guys and girls. I think I, I know I said in the first day back too that I think you could have gone uh, if there was such a magazine as School Digest. I mean, I know there isn't, <laughs> but if there was, like Architectural Digest, and you see these beautiful like Brad Pitt oriented homes that he loves to build or whatever. If there was such a thing as School Digest, you could have taken a picture of any one of our schools that first day back. Like there wasn't a weed to be found. The schools looked amazing, just amazing. Um, and I, I always think that that first day back, and I know Kathy, you were there. This when we acknowledge the the custodians in the morning. That's like the biggest cheer in the house. Oh, yeah, the applause is unbelievable. The applause is unbelievable because everybody knows how hard everybody works to get those buildings ready. So, um, hats off to Rob to you because it's been quite a summer. <laughs> You know, I mean, you are the pivotal point to all of this, you know, with this mosquitoes and, and it's been a lot. And I know it's been a lot of long days. It's been a lot of long weekends that you've been working here on Saturday and Sunday. You've been coming in to stay on top of everything. Just so appreciative. So thank you for all you do. Thank you. Any other questions? Any questions, comments? Yes, the young pesky question. Um, the leaching field is to come online on the 18th. 18th or 19th. Is different. that a problem with the DEP? Didn't they want it on September? They wanted it on September 1st, but they, you know, we've been in contact with them right along, so they know what we were up against and some of the issues they had. So we're in good standing with them. They're fine with what's going on. The first phone call we made as soon as we dug up the little dumpster area was the DEP saying, they were there pretty quick. Uh, you won't believe what tour we just came across. <laughs> Honestly, that was a sight to see, to, to, to stand there and see all of that. And I said to Rob at first, and I was naive and I didn't know what I was saying at that point in time, I admit that. I said, well, this will give us an opportunity to just kind of clean it up. And he said, no, Brooke, you need to come and see it. This is not something we can clean up. And you were right, we had to just push the dirt right back over and keep it covered up. So yeah, it was quite a mess, quite a mess. So so DEP has, again, been fabulous to work because we're doing a lot of work with DEP right now. We've got excellent relationships with them. So. Yeah. Okay. Rob, thank you so much. Thank and thanks you. for thank all you do to keep things running. Appreciate it. And now, Anne Marie Stoika. There's so much to catch you all up on over the summer. After I the summer know. Month. Hi. Hi. How are you doing? I'm doing fine. Thank you. It's nice thank to you. see you. Thank you. It's good to see all of you too. Um, the summer hiring season mm -hmm. presents the Human Resources Office with its greatest opportunity to contribute to student achievement. We do that by supporting the principals and the other administrators um, in their quest to hire well, which is, in the opinion of many, one of the most important things that an administrator does. The actual hiring decisions, of course, are made by the principals because they're the experts in recognizing what good teaching looks like. We back them up, though, and play a supporting role by seeing that they have a strong pool of candidates from which to select. 
We verify the credentials of the applicants, check their transcripts, check their licensure, uh, check their work history. Um, for safety reasons, we check their quarries and their fingerprints to make sure that all that's in good order. And once a hiring decision is made, we contact the applicant, now the selected candidate, um, and make a fair and appropriate offer in a timely manner before someone else snatches them up. <laughs> and uh, we onboard them and we welcome them. So thank you for this opportunity and to let you know how this year's hiring season went. We think it went very well. We're very pleased with our newly hired colleagues. Part of the reason we have such a strong incoming group is the reputation of Neshoba as a high-performing district and as a desirable employer. People want to work here, and we get a large number of applications from a great qualified pool of applicants from which we can select the best of the best. As an example, one of our positions drew 223 applications which means that the, our new colleague um, beat out 222 other people to get that job. Um, most, many of our openings had more than 100 applications, and, and most had more than 50 people vying for the job. Mm -hmm. So applying for a job at Neshoba is, um, is a competitive, it's a competitive venture. We started the school year with 19 new permanent teachers and two long-term subs will be in with us for the full year because they're replacing full year absences. Our 20 new, 21 new teachers are a good mix of experienced teachers and those who are um, entering, uh, entering the profession. We've got nine who are relatively new to the teaching field, five who are in their first five years of teaching, and seven who have uh, six or more years of teaching experience. That's a good mix of new and uh, seasoned educators and really that's, that's what you want. Four of our new teachers were promoted to their teaching positions after having already distinguished themselves as instructional assistants. So they, were, they have proven ability and the principals had an opportunity to, uh, to see their work. Twelve of our new teachers have got a master's degree and one has a doctorate. Uh, most of the eight who holds bachelor's degrees are well on their way to earning their master's degrees. We also welcomed nine new instructional assistants who are all highly qualified. Several have master's degrees themselves, and many of them have teaching licenses or both. We have four additions to our extended learning staff and one new custodian. We have two new administrators. We have a welcoming Mark Levine, who's our new assistant principal at Florence, sorry, and our new part-time principal at the Hale Middle School, Patrick Martins. <laughs> <laughs> who's, who's really not new to us at all. Not new at all, but he's, you know, yeah, he's, he's the he's oldest bad guy. <laughs> What would we do without Patrick Perkins? I mean, really, he's just amazing. You shudder to think. <laughs> At the end of August, our mentor coordinators, Karen uh, Mayotte and Kim Rocha, in conjunction with the Departments of Teaching and Learning and, uh, and Technology, organized and led our new teacher orientation program. All of our new teachers participated. We, have 100, we had 100% attendance. They met their mentors. They met the district leaders. They had their orientation to the district. The NREA, Kevin came and spoke to them. They got an overview of professional development, of teaching and learning, um, and the student information systems, uh, power school and power teacher. The reviews for our new teacher orientation are always positive, and I'd like to recognize our, our mentor co-coordinators, Karen Manavat and Kim Rocha, and also the Department of Teaching and Learning for making that a, such a successful day. With the start of the new school year, 22 of our teachers uh, reached the career, career milestone of professional teacher status. It's a significant accomplishment. It's similar to the former, or maybe a little bit more familiar concept of tenure. It's <coughs> awarded to those who have successfully completed three full licensed years of teaching. During those three years, they were observed and they're evaluated very closely. Each of the 22 has met and showed this high standards. They've received the recommendation of his or her principal, and they've been approved by the superintendent. Professional status is a really big deal in a teacher's career. I and mean, we congratulated those 22 teachers at the high school on opening day and recognized them. Last week, we arranged again this year for, through Maya, our insurer, for several wellness programs for our employees at no cost. The first is a five week Fitbit challenge that's going to start on September 23rd. Maya will supply the participants with free Fitbits where they, people can use their own. We have 97 of our employees signed up to participate in the challenge, which is going to be a fun and friendly, at least it starts friendly, <laughs> competition among the communities. There'll be the Stowe, Lancaster, Bolton, and High School will be the four 
uh, the four groups competing against one another. So if you happen to be one of our in one of our buildings or one of our or you're up here in the offices and you see someone standing there and they're marching in place, <laughs> you'll know that that's that that's what they're doing. Then later in the month we're starting it's an eight or ten week after school program called uh, Namaste and nutrition, which as you might guess is a, a combination of a, a yoga and a nutrition um, awareness type thing. It's always it's always well subscribed. Maya also offers uh, some online wellness uh, programs. We recently had one on brain health, um, sugar awareness. Uh, we had one on hydration and water. They always have something about nutrition. And I think we're in the middle of one now on cholesterol. The end, the employees can choose, you know, if they, if they, the employees who participate can choose a little gift, you know, a, a water bottle or a yoga mat or, you know, that sort of thing. Um, those are very well received and we're pleased to be able to continue those this year. I'd like to close by thanking my colleagues, Vicki Chardier and Darcy Wardwell. Uh, they always work hard keeping our office humming, but never so much than in the summertime. As an example, um, our teachers got their first paychecks. Mind you, school started on August 27th. They got their first paychecks on August 31st. So there, was, there were a lot of new people to, to onboard to, to do their health insurance forms and their banking information and all their licensure and now their everything. And it was all entered. It was, everybody was in the system and everyone got their paycheck on August 31st. So I really um, feel very lucky you know, to be working with people like Vicki and Darcy you know, because they really do yeoman's duty, especially in the summertime, although year round, really. I want to thank you again for the opportunity to update you on the exciting world of HR. And, uh, <laughs> <laughs> I want to give any questions, questions for me. Questions for, for Anne Marie? Hmm. One of the other things that they do in the summer too is these offices work very closely. HR and the business office, uh, they sit around this table <coughs> because there's a lot you can imagine for the budget purposes and for making sure that everything is still exactly where it needs to be. Um, they spend like literally days around this table making sure and cross-referencing everything. It's a huge undertaking. So um, yeah, Darcy and Vicki do a great job. Thank As you. do you, Anne-Marie. Thank you so much. We appreciate it. Thank, thank, you. thank you. Thank you for the update. Okay, so now we have um, on the agenda school committee goals. I passed out the proposed goals, the draft of the goals to folks, and um, we had done an evaluation of um, where we think we are in terms of our um, operational protocols of governance operations member relations, uh, financial, strategic planning, and fiscal management, community relations, and, and conduct of meetings. So these are categories that MASC lays out and suggests um, ways to look at how we're doing in these areas. And again, I think this is the first year that we have done a, a formal evaluation and have set um, goals specific to the school committee. So again, this is a draft, and what I have done is, based on the results of the survey, uh, put together these um, proposed um, goals for folks to consider, and in um, most cases have assigned um, either a committee, an individual, or a group to um, responsibility for them. So if we could go through them and then we can I'll entertain comments or questions, and I've allotted uh, 20 minutes to this on the agenda. So if, if we're not finished in 20 minutes, then we are going to um, stop at that point <coughs> and um, pick it up. It's 15. Later on. Oh, 15? Oh, then we better get going, huh? Sorry, does mm -hmm. anyone have an extra so, copy? I do oh, yes, I do, right here. Oops, sorry. <coughs> there you go. Okay. All right, so the first one under <coughs> governance, and I think when I look at this, this is basically what the policy subcommittee's job is. So Lee and I are on the, uh, are the policy <laughs> uh, subcommittee, and um, we will be completing the policy review uh, with MASC and bringing um, the policies uh, to the committee for review and approval. So that's basically what we do. Um, the um, new member um, orientation will include an orientation to the school committee 
the school, yeah, the school committee policy manual, which is different than the school committee <coughs> manual, and that will be uh, my responsibility to make sure that there is attention paid to the whole policy aspect and the specifics of policy in addition to the other things that the school committee does. Um, school committee will review the district improvement plan annually for alignment with the district's mission, vision, and core values. Uh, that's a uh, school committee's responsibility and we this year did that during a um, an additional meeting over the summertime and Brooke and I have actually parsed it out <coughs> over several meetings um, after the superintendent's evaluation process. So that is the school committee's responsibility as well. Um, anything about governance, questions, comments? <clears throat> yes, Leah. I think the only thing that we were saying the last time we met was that uh, the way that the district improvement plan achieves our check mark mm -hmm. should be run in a way that we don't feel like we're um, kind of knocking you guys over. Maybe, right? So, like the last meeting that we had, it was here it is. Um, is this okay? Whereas then we stepped back and said maybe it's a better idea to say here it is, take some time to think about it. Right, yes. like it might be a two-step process. Well actually what I mentioned is that if you're absolutely right and to have it, um, to, to do that work over um, two or three school committee meetings instead of just having it on one, you know, a, a one meeting where we're expected to do everything. Yeah. So I, I have to go back with Brooke and look at, after the meetings, we go back and look at the planning calendar. And so, but we did have discussions over the summer about doing, you know, backing it up, having more time, but doing it um, during the school meetings. Okay? Mike, did you have? No. Okay. Thank you. Um, operations, um, the superintendent, HR director, and chair will develop an evaluation of the new member orientation. So I think that's sort of self-explanatory and who's involved and um, we will be, once it's uh, complete, um, share it with the, the school committee. Um, uh, personnel subcommittee will conduct an annual evaluation of the school committee manual, which is part of the charge of the PSC. Um, the two uh, big areas of responsibility for the, for the PSC is the superintendent's evaluation process and also um, maintenance, if you will, of the, the, the school uh, committee manual, and that includes um, surveying the committee about any additions or changes to it over the course of the year. So that's the responsibility of the PSC. Uh, member relations. Uh, per school committee policy, BAA, conduct a school committee self-evaluation, the results of which will be reviewed and discussed at the June workshop. Um, we started this um, this year. We do have a, a policy, BAA, in our policy manual, but um, to the best of my knowledge, have not done a self-evaluation, so we will continue this process, uh, and I will uh, most likely send last year's um, <coughs> uh, protocol process um, to folks for uh, feedback before I send out the, the, the evaluation for folks to complete. So I'll, I'll get a sense of if we need to tweak it in any way. Okay? Financial, strategic planning, and fiscal management. Annually and prior to the start of the budget, of budget development, School committee will be in service regarding the district's long-term financial strategic plan, constituencies involved in budget development, and how the school committee presents and advocates for the budget. So um, you will soon see <coughs> that uh, budget development starts like tomorrow, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and um, the, um, the budget and warrant committee does a lot of the um, um, work with um, Pat and with um, Mm -hmm. Brooke and then brings things to our attention. But overall, I think to have a big picture understanding about how things are done and how the pieces fit together is important for us. 
And so I will talk with Brooke about scheduling something in the near future so that we have that big picture outlook. So that'll be a future agenda item, okay? Um, the community relations, the school committee will review the district comprehensive communication plan and its components. So this is something we had um, the not this past year, but the previous year had a communication committee and a communication plan was put in place. Uh, this year we approved a channels of communication uh, protocol. Um, what I would like us to look at is how everything fits together. And um, so we have to take a look at it and find a way to evaluate um, it's the effectiveness of all the different pieces of it. So that's something that I will be working with Brooke on to bring forward. Okay. The other piece of this is that this policy subcommittee will review <coughs> the policy for citizens' comments and present recommendations to um, the school committee. So um, we do have a policy. Um, Uh, BEDH for um, citizens comments public comments and I know that among members of the committee there's an interest in um, looking some other ways to get uh, citizens comments and there's a, something that I'll speak to you about very shortly um, that might um, give us some additional uh, face time with the public um, any uh, changes or comments about the bullets on the community relations. And then the last one, conduct of meetings. Um, the only thing that really came up was um, this idea of looking at making the, the school committee meeting room uh, conducive to productive discussion and decision making, and that would require um, an ad hoc committee to look into this and make recommendations. So <coughs> no one is assigned to that. It would be volunteers. Um, so if folks want to think about that and come back to it, if there's interest in, in doing that and having an ad hoc committee, then I would want to know. So do you want me to check in again or? Is anybody interested in being on an ad hoc committee to look at this topic? Yeah, yeah. So Joseph cool and Mary. <laughs> okay. So we can connect on what the uh, the charge of the committee would be and, and what you need to do it. Thank you for doing that. Okay. So are there any questions, uh, concerns, comments? It's kept. Okay. Oh, Kevin. Oh, okay. Okay. Any questions, concerns, <coughs> comments about the goals? Would anyone like to make a motion to accept the goals for this year, the school committee goals for 2019, 2020? I'll move. Thanks, Joseph. Yeah. Um, second. Second. Okay. Thank you, Leah. All in favor? Opposed? Okay. Thank you. So much. And now, with the, oh, so um, we have a motion that is going to be made by a member. This is an example of something that a member asked to, to be placed on the agenda, and it has been placed there. And there is actually a, a protocol that um, is part of Robert's Rules of Order, and it's known as the main motion process. So, um, the member makes um, the motion uh, to take, um, makes the motion, and then the motion is seconded. And then um, there is discussion or debate, and the uh, member who introduces the motion starts the um, discussion, maybe provides information or gives an overview. And then um, uh, the chair closes the discussion, states the question and asks for a vote. So that's the process we're going to follow. And so at this point, I'm going to recognize um, Mary McCarthy, 
um, to um, make her motion. Okay, thank you, Kathy. Um, I move that we include the Pledge of Allegiance as a standing agenda item following the call to order at all regular Neshoba Regional School District School Committee meetings. Thank you. Can I have a second? I'll second that one. Okay, Joseph. Okay, Mary. All right. Um, it seems especially fitting to be considering this motion on the anniversary of the September 11th, 2001 terrorist attacks on the United States of America. As we know, public schools were founded with a civic mission of educating students to be engaged citizens capable of contributing <coughs> to the common good. Across the United States is a renewed emphasis on civic education. The new 2018 Massachusetts History and Social Science Curriculum Framework includes an increased emphasis on civics at all grade levels, including a new grade eight course on civics. In my experience in education, school committee meetings began with standing and reciting in unison the Pledge of Allegiance to the flag of the United States of America. Many of our local town board meetings include the Pledge of Allegiance. According to MASC, many school committee meetings in the Commonwealth of Massachusetts include the Pledge of Allegiance. Not that the pledge isn't without some controversy, no one, including students in schools, can be required to recite the pledge in keeping with our First Amendment right to freedom of speech. As such, the Pledge of Allegiance can be considered as a civics lesson in itself. The Pledge of Allegiance remains as an example of our shared commitment to our democratic republic and our vision of liberty and justice for all. I look forward to our discussion and vote on this motion as I turn the floor back to our chairperson, Kathy. Thank you, Mayor. Any, oh, um, I thought you raised your hand. <laughs> <laughs> All right, um, any um, discussion, comments, Steve? Yes, I have three points I, want, I wish to make. Number one, having stood on the back loading dock of my company in Brooklyn 18 years ago today and seeing the second plane crash into the World Trade Center, where just a few years before I had had an office, was quite an experience and one I will never forget. Number two, have, being a veteran, and probably the only veteran, maybe, in this room at the present time. <clears throat> oh, Steve, you need to speak up, please. <clears throat> and probably being the only veteran in this room at this Thank time, I would, I would also like, as my third point, to say, Unfortunately, the pledge to the flag, as has been said, has become somewhat controversial, and the wrapping of the flag by certain political groups in this country um, leaves me kind of cold. And while I grew up not only saying the Pledge of Allegiance to the flag every day, but the Our Father every morning, and I don't think any of us would have a point or try to make a point that we should go back to that particular uh, recitation, I am against that, against having the pledge to the flag at the beginning of our meetings. Thank you. Anyone else? Yes, I like to Joseph. Um, I want to tell my, my colleague, and I, I respect what my colleague from Still has to say, mm -hmm. but I cannot support Dr. McCarthy's motion uh, more vociferously. Uh, to me, this is more of an equity issue. My understanding is that the protocol in this district is that we ask our students to stand and pledge, uh, pledge allegiance excuse me, to the flag each morning. If I recall, at our graduation ceremony, we also stood mm -hmm. and uh, recited the pledge. Mm -hmm. I talked to Mary a little bit about this back before we were on the school committee. To me, the pledge is more iconic than anything else, and I do understand that it becomes a sort of a controversy. <coughs> But to me, it's always been a part of the American educational system. It's as iconic as the railroad school bus and the Red Apple. Mm -hmm. um, I fully support um, Dr. McCarthy's motion, mostly because I don't want to be a member who would ask any student in this district to do anything that I myself would not do. Mm -hmm. Other comments? I just, I just want to make one comment. And first of all, I want to thank you for your service. 
and I'm aware of the <coughs> sometimes the, the the political winds that blow, and um, I do want to uh, reiterate that one of the most fundamental rights that we have is, is freedom of expression and freedom of speech. And I have, in watching sometimes the, the landscape out there, um, become distressed when uh, the feeling that everyone needs to conform to a certain point of view is met with um, derision. And, and that's not what we're about. And you're right. It, 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 uh, Massachusetts state law says that schools have to uh, offer the Pledge of Allegiance and it's expected that people either say it or sit respectfully while it is recited, but no one is, is required to say it. So um, I just <coughs> don't want um, this to become a political thing. Everyone has their own view of what is right uh, for them and um, if there is any more um, any more comments or discussion, I would like to entertain them right now. If not, I would like to move the vote. Any more questions, comments, discussion? Okay. All those in favor of reciting the Pledge of Allegiance at the beginning of each regular school committee meeting after the call to order, please raise your hand. Thank you. Opposed? Okay. Thank you, everyone. <coughs> okay. Um, the last item under new business is something that um, I have a citizen comment discussion, and I, I see it along the lines of improving communication. Um, and this is something that I actually picked up at the MASC conference that folks talked about. There was a lot of discussion about citizens' comments and what folks do, and, and by and large, most school districts do as we do, and if there are to be citizens' comments, they are said, they are, they are directed toward an agenda item. And we've had discussions about, you know, what we want to allow um, on this committee, and um, a couple of uh, school districts actually um, call something, they call something, um, school committee office hours, because it's not an hour. But um, what I, let me read what I wrote. Um, <coughs> uh, per our policy, BEDH, our school committee meetings have citizens comments address agenda items at the MS, MASE Summer Institute. Uh, districts with the same policy, some districts with the same policy said they have office hours um, held by one or two members where citizens can bring forward other issues. Um, my idea would be to pilot holding school committee uh, quote unquote office time prior to each school committee meeting from 5.30 to 5.45 and apply the same policy that we have for citizens comments during the school committee meeting. Um, the pilot would run from October to December. Um, Elaine and I, and you said you would alternate with me, right? Okay, yeah. Elaine and I will alternate chairing these sessions um, and no more than two other school committee meetings can join us. I'd really like one other person to join uh, Elaine or myself. Uh, topics will be shared <coughs> with the school committee. So we would have something um, probably uh, depending, because I think that you have your um, budget warrant committee meetings. Usually at five, yes. Usually at five, and we would do it, but we, wouldn't, we would find a place to have it either here or in um, the teaching and learning conference room, which is right um, below us. And people would be able to bring up other issues that are not on the agenda, but we would apply the same rules. There would be no disparagement um, of uh, personnel, no sharing of personal information. Um, but it would be a way to, um, to allow folks. I mean, people can still email us um, and that, but there are times I think when people want, just want to tell us stuff. So um, I would like to see where folks, what folks think about this idea. Yes, Leah. So um, I think that I've had now two opportunities to meet with constituents, mm -hmm. and I think it's a great idea. Mm -hmm. 
I think that when I did do it, um, Elaine joined me at one point. Um, people felt heard. Um, they thought it was an opportunity to express things that they wouldn't otherwise have nowhere to bring it. And oftentimes, it, there was really no need for it to go any further. And so <coughs> I think that it's like a sell almost for people. So I totally support it. Yes. You know, I'll say this, I, I will fully support the endeavor, but I will say that it is a bit ponderous to me that this district, unlike many other bodies politics in the Commonwealth, does not have a public participation, public comment uh, portion of its agenda. Uh, we do, excuse me, we do, but it's, it's limited to um, agenda items. Mm -hmm. In many other jurisdictions in the Commonwealth, it is not. Mm -hmm. And it is an opportunity for individuals to come not only before their body politic, be a board selectman, school committee, or what have you, but in front of their entire town, because it is generally broadcast by the local cable access to you know, voice their issues, concerns, and what have you. I'll be honest with you, it can sometimes be a very uh, high adventure type of uh, agenda item. Mm -hmm. But overall, in my experience, it's been generally productive. People are generally contrite and uh, respectful. I mean, there are some occasions <coughs> where things get a little out of control. Mm -hmm. um, by example, I think the Native School Committee recently had an issue in 2018 regarding public participation mm -hmm. um, that actually went to the Superior Court, and the Superior Court actually sided with the um, participants as opposed to the district committee. Mm -hmm. But if this is, you know, if this is what's proposed, I would fully support it. But as one member or one seventh or one eighth of this committee, I, I frankly would welcome full public participation on any issue that any member of the district feels they wish to voice to the district, district committee. Mm -hmm. Well, like I said, when we looked at our goals, one of the goals of um, the policy committee would be to look at the policy. As our policy is written, it addresses items on, on the agenda. So um, it's, it's open, but before we address the policy issue, this would be something that right. we could and it, it, it sounds to me that this, is a, a this may be where we end up, or it may be a stepping stone to something else. So in that regard, I would be fully supportive of it. Okay. Nice. Um, yeah, that's, that's just like sort of exactly what I was going to say. Um, because we have a goal for the year to think about this, to borrow a term from Brooke thoughtfully, um, I think that that's going to take some time, no matter what the end result of it is. And in the meantime, I'm all for trying some things, putting some stuff out there, and, and um, yeah, just trying it, doing some experiments, and seeing what works. It's not going to be anything that works for everyone, either all of us as committee members or the entire community. Um, but if we put some stuff out there, maybe we'll figure out what works while we're doing the, the official policy process. Mike? If this is indeed a, a, a pilot uh, for, uh, I think you said a couple of months? Uh, October, November, December. OK, so three months. Is this something that? Um, could be reported back to the school committee. In Absolutely, terms of the feedback yeah. that we've gotten, and, and sort of the impressions, what has worked, what what challenges. Well, or, is that certainly, and, and just as <coughs> during citizens' comments, we're quite aware of the topics that are brought forward, and um, there, we don't engage in discussion, um, but um, something may be referred uh, to Brooke to to do some more work on, or for us to get more information on. So it would be the same thing. At the so, um, if if some I think the the first time we would do it would be October 9th, um, at the um, end of the meeting, maybe during correspondence or even during citizens' comments, we would just mention the topics that were brought up and what the disposition might be. So there would be it would have visibility to the community. Leah. I would ask to just keep in the end in mind, so what is the objective? I think the objective is to improve transparency with the community, give community members an opportunity to communicate more directly, mm -hmm. and so therefore, <coughs> in order to measure whether or not it's effective, you need to have, you need to, I think we need to think through how can we like survey people um, on its effectiveness, mm -hmm. Because I don't think that we would be able to judge if it was an effective method mm -hmm. in isolation. We would need to ask constituents, hey, everybody, we communicated that this was available to you. 
did you take advantage of it? Why didn't you take advantage? You, do you understand what I mean? Yeah, and, and I, I don't want to, I'd like to, 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 to think about that because when you think about it, our constituents is every single person in all three towns. All right. And you wouldn't have to collect data from every person, but at least offer the opportunity for them to weigh in on its effectiveness. Well, I think that there'd have to be a way to do that, and yeah. I really haven't thought that through yet. Okay. But what the heck? Yeah. So I do think it's a good idea. I think that it's worth trying. Um, but I also am not used to citizens' comments. Uh, where people, whoops, I, I haven't even been on committee for very long, but I was, uh, did come to meetings even before I was on committee. And time after time, citizens came to meetings to talk about something and then read the policy that it has to be something that's on the agenda. So they really couldn't talk then. And that has not been my experience. And I know we've talked about this and it opens up the whole world in a way. Um, however, I think when people make the effort to come to a meeting and you know, whatever they've had to do, child care, timing, they get here, then they find out, well, next time you come, look at the agenda ahead of time because citizens' comments are only for that. So I would like us to look at that again. Sure. Because, yeah. uh, but I do think that this idea certainly is worthwhile and I was going to echo what Mike said about some way of whatever is talked about um, that can be brought to committee, mm -hmm. that you would bring it to, to committee. Absolutely. Yeah. The, we allow 15 minutes for citizens' comments. And I think that if you have, in, in, in many districts, they give priority to people who want to address things that are on the um, agenda. And then if whatever time period, and, and most districts <coughs> have, 15 minutes that they allow, some 20, um, then that's it. You, you, because oh, when you look at, we're already uh, 10 minutes behind schedule, um, but that's okay. But um, there was one community that lets public comments, citizens' comments, go as long as it needs to go. And the work that we need to do, there's a lot of work we want to hear from people. I think with the advent of, of email, there's a lot more opportunity um, to, to communicate uh, directly. Um, but I think that all the issues that are being raised are things that we can look at when we look at the policy. Um, and um, But this is a, a, a good first step, and we'll see how it works. And I think we'll give feedback. There's, I'm not quite sure how it would work, but um, we'll figure out a way to do it. Some ideas. Mm -hmm. Then I'd love to hear them, but not now. <laughs> <laughs> Okay. Uh, yeah. I think similarly, or sort of bookend what Leah was talking about, we're going to need a way to communicate that this is available as well. I we know. To put something together. The there. members of the press are here, so maybe at the next <laughs> meeting we'll have something more concrete yeah. to put together. I'll put together a proposal for next time. And we, this is informal. It's a trial. It's not part of our regular meeting, so we don't have to vote on it. I just wanted to share that with you because I, I'm aware of what the concerns were. Uh, from members of the committee, and so I'll put together a plan, a proposal, and Lee is going to let me know how best to evaluate it. Okay, <coughs> super. Thank you so much. Okay, uh, there is no old business, subcommittee reports. Mike, do you have a report for us? Uh, yeah, the um, personnel subcommittee received uh, a, a draft of the superintendent's annual plan. Um, we reviewed uh, the draft of four uh, goals, a district improvement goal, uh, two professional practice goals, and uh, one student learning goal. Uh, uh, the 89 members of the personnel committee uh, submitted some feedback, uh, and we're going to be probably meeting multiple times prior to um, uh, prior to the recommendation of the school committee. Uh, but I think we're still on track to do that by the first meeting in October. You're not going to be here. Correct. So yeah. I was just I was going to That's email right. you that on the download, but since you brought up, so we'll have to schedule it for the twenty third. Okay. 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 Yeah. All right. Thanks. Um, Steve. You have a. You're not going to be here in the first meeting in October. Correct. Never mind. <laughs> yeah. All right. It's Yom, it's Yom Kippur, so. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So that means everybody <clears throat> else has to be here. Is, that does anyone else have a conflict with the ninth? Okay. And if anyone else cannot be here, you need to let me know as soon as possible. 
All right, thanks for letting us know. Just to add you to my list of absentees for that day. <laughs> okay, thanks. Okay, uh, Steve, budget warrant. Budget warrant. I'm, um, we had kind of an aborted meeting uh, earlier this afternoon. Um, I guess no. people didn't remember. <laughs> Never got any notice. That it was set in June that we would meet at 4 o'clock today. Be that as it may. Be that as it may. Um, so I sat with Brooke and Pat, um, and we went, over, we went over a few things. I had a few, few questions on, on the numbers. Basically, we're coming out exactly where we felt we were going to be coming out. Uh, we will have 800 and some odd thousand dollars to put back into E&D, although we also have $750,000 we'll be taking out of E&D for the 2019-2020 budget. Um, other, other than that, we'll see a, a lot of the uh, final numbers, I guess, next, at the next meeting. And uh, we're, we're in good shape as we move forward. Okay, thank you. So it wasn't an official meeting. No, so <coughs> there was no official update. meeting, so there, so there were no minute, okay. minutes taken. So um, uh, Mike and Steve, do you have the dates for your um, meetings for throughout the well, year? Well, our next, our next meeting will be before the next uh, uh, school committee meeting, I think that's the 23rd. Okay, but at five o'clock. Okay, so uh, my point is that I had asked um, at our meeting in June for the chairs to give Alita the meetings for the year, so they're part of our school committee calendar, so everybody's aware. Well, that's. Go ahead. All right, I, I'm just thinking it's difficult because we really don't get into the budget. We do, once a month we look at the numbers from the previous month, but we really don't get into the forward-looking uh, numbers until after January okay. after, after the budget so seminar. So is what you're telling me that at your meetings you'll set a date for the following meeting? Yes. Okay. So do you have a date for your next meeting? I just said the 23rd of September. Thank you. I remember now that you said that. You're welcome. <laughs> okay. Yes, Mary. So I took the minutes at the at the subcommittee um, meetings, but it's subcommittee meeting minutes, and the meeting was to be at five o'clock before the show of school committee meeting. However, because we had, I, and I never heard anything. That's okay. I, it was, yeah. but I don't want that to happen because neither there was no one there. There were three of us. Right. And so the one of us knew, and I took the minutes. Okay. So. So moving forward, we will make sure I will send that things are for communicated in Thank a timely you. fashion. And, and and been okay, no, no, no yes. harm, no foul. Okay. Um, consent agenda. <coughs> Would someone like to make a motion to approve the September 11th, 2019 consent agenda, including the meeting <coughs> June 5th, 2019. Roles and Responsibilities Workshop Minutes of June 19th, 2019. District Improvement Plan Workshop Minutes of August 7th, 2019. And the Warrant of September 13th, 2019. So moved. Second? Second. Second. <laughs> I'm going to give that to Joe because you've seconded it all. <laughs> okay. All in favor? Okay. So let me see where we're at. Respondents, items to be considered for next or future agendas. All right. So what do we have? I have to. Um, okay. No, nope, we don't have to do that. Um, Future? Yes, Mike. Uh, I think we said a proposal for the comment, the comment discussion proposal for the next meeting. Oh yes, so okay. A formalized proposal. Yes, thanks. And you mean for the so pre-meeting? Um, yes. Not the formal policy. No, not the policy. That's going to start a policy. Right. Yeah. Okay. Proposal citizens comments. Um, okay. Yes. Yes. Uh, I have something, and it will take perhaps 30 seconds of the superintendent's time at the next meeting. It'll probably take 30 seconds of the time. 
in the interim period between now and the next meeting. But I did have a constituent request for some information regarding um, possibility, if one does not exist, of the creation of a master calendar for the district. Um, what this constituent advisor was that in trying to organize anything within the district, um, sometimes they have to go to you know, the different schools mm -hmm. to look at their calendars mm -hmm. to make sure there's no conflict. Okay. And they've asked for some yeah. possibility of doing that. I don't know if that exists already, but. Actually, we've, we have looked into this. We've already tried this. I, I'm not sure where we landed, but it seems to me like we tried to do this even this last time, go around with the, uh, we, was, we support the notion. We haven't got the means yet to do it, but we support the notion of doing in, that. In that regard, Madam Chairman, I would just withdraw my request. That the, the superintendent is already aware of this. And so okay, but I would want to follow up with, the, I will follow up with the superintendent. Okay. okay. Um, we need to plan an update of the um, special education. Um, Just a SPED update. Yeah, the SPED update to include a program evaluation. Um, we, we are going, I, I think that's in the October. I think that's okay, we'll just have to in October. Yeah. Okay. Um, does anybody have anything else for our future? Or I, guarantee, next? I guarantee there'll be other items. I'm sure. <laughs> Leah, a quick question. This might just be me being new. Uh, we, ha we had a constituent request to consider um, flipping the start times of high school students and elementary school students and that whole so the whole the topic is school start times <laughs> yeah. okay that I don't know if it's already been discussed no it or hasn't or and it's an it's an enormous so undertaking surely okay when, when we do this I think it's we can identify things we want to talk about but it's not the appropriate time to and I don't mean this as an admonishment to anybody just that in the interest of time, we can take down the topic. I will talk with Brooke about it, and then we can come around. Okay, great. Um, there was something else, mass calendar, school top start times, the SPED special education update. Was there something else? Okay, oh, I know what we wanted to do. So we're looking at the, the, the planning calendar is in your materials if you want to look. So for next time, we have the guidance update, mm -hmm. the district improvement plan. Yeah. We approved it, but it hasn't been presented at a school committee meeting. Um, the business manager reports a treasurer report, middle school athletic revolving funds review, fiscal year end report. I think we did the middle school year. tonight, right? Oh, no, oh, no we didn't. No, no, no. Do this is about right. Right. revolving funds. Yeah. Fiscal year end report, year end revenue update, uh, dormant revolving funds transfer and student activity new old updates. That's, that's going to be a lot for next meeting. Yes. Okay. <laughs> Without one adding one more thing. Okay. Yeah. All right. It's also on there. Maybe you have another copy of the middle school BC trips. Oh. So, yeah. Not on this one. Second one down. Middle school. Middle school. Oh, no. oh I s no, that's the revolving funds. Middle okay, school middle DC schools. trip approvals. I must yeah. have an outdated, um, yeah. Thing. Okay, trip approvals. That's there. Yeah, that's going to be a long, a long meeting. Mm -hmm. okay. Not if I can help it. <laughs> yeah. so, Kathy, yes. Uh, not for the next meeting, but someplace on the planning um, calendar, we'll be looking at a representation in terms yes, of. Yes, that's on there. It's regional okay. agreement of oh, that's membership. Okay. That's what that Good. is. Yeah. Okay. Anything else? Okay. So um, Elaine is going to make the motion to enter into executive session. I move the school committee enter into executive session at 8.25 p.m. pursuant to MGL Chapter 30A, Section 21A3, to discuss strategy with respect to collective bargaining or litigation if an open meeting may have a detrimental effect on the bargaining or litigation position of the public body and the chair so declares. George B. George King v. Shoba Regional School District and Patricia Marone, <coughs> Civil Tactics, Chapter 18C v. 643A, executive session to include Superintendent Clenchy, Assistant Superintendent Dr. McGuire, Business Manager Pat Marone and Legal Counsel Kevin Freytag. Committee will adjourn in executive session. Second. That's Who second? Call. Oh, no. Who well, seconded? Who seconded? That's the motion. You did. You just seconded it. I did? I didn't yeah. think I could. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I will. No. <laughs> Sign me up. Okay. Uh, roll call. Um, Alita, can you take Dr. Oh, Steve, go ahead. Dr. McCarthy? 
Yes. Mike Horish? Here. Myself, yes. Leah Viverito? Yes. Elaine Sanfilippo? Yes. Kathy Codian? Yes. And Joseph Gleason? Yes. Okay. okay. Um, why don't we take a five minute?